Hey, what's up, everybody? Thanks for tuning in to another episode of Let There Be Talk. Today is Tuesday, September 5th. Yeah, rent is due Tuesday, September 5th. Insane. Almost the end of the year. Almost the end of the year. Uh, how are you guys, man? I'm. Uh, the this, this show's a day late because I always find that if I put it out on the holiday weekend... For some reason, it seems to get ignored or forgotten about, and then an, uh, a crushing episode slips through the cracks. I've looked at the stats. I know what I'm talking about. <laughs> anyway, great guest today, man. Uh, I don't know if you, uh, you know, uh, if you're a Counting Crows fan. I am a big Counting Crows fan. I've talked about it many times on here, August and Everything After, one of my favorite records ever. Also, I love Recovering the Satellites, and throughout all their body of work, they've always had one, two, three great songs on each record. Uh, You know, just that first fucking record is an absolute masterpiece. If you just look at that, man, the tunes on that thing. Omaha, Omaha, somewhere in middle America. Fucking great record, man. Perfect blue buildings. Um, You know, of course, Mr. Jones, the hit. You know, the one that grabbed everybody, the hit. Then round here, round here. Fucking great, man. Great. Somebody tweeted at me. They're like, I don't know, man. Oh, I don't get that band. It's like, that's how life is, man. Sometimes it doesn't hit you. I didn't like Springsteen or the Dead at all. You know, and then one day you're just fucking, and you don't even know when it's going to happen. You're just in a Starbucks. Fuck, I got to get me a goddamn coffee. And you're just brain, just some, it's like a, it's like a, a, a like an alien space pod. It opens something in your brain that accepts uh, a new idea once every 20 years, like your your rigid brain, it just... And all of a sudden, out of nowhere, Omaha, somewhere in middle America. And you're like, oh, oh, fuck, these guys are great. I've been a moron all my life. I can't believe I didn't know that. And then you just dive down the rabbit hole and you start telling everybody about, man, you guys listening to Counting Crows? <laughs> That's how it was with Breaking Bad. Hey, you guys watching Breaking Bad after like three years it was on? So fucking funny. That's how it is though, man. It just fucking hits you. I had a turn up a couple weeks ago. First time in my whole fucking life I had a turn up. I was eating something. I go, God, this is great. What is it? The guy goes, that's a turnip. It's like, turnip? I've never had a turnip. I'm 51. I never had a turnip ever. And I realized why. I I, I don't like the name. (laughs) You ever just shut something down because of the name? You know what I mean? Like a band or or anything. I was like, turnip? This ain't the fucking 30s. Nobody's eating these. Would you cook them in a crock pot? Is that what you cook? You simmered them up in a crock pot? Let's have some turnips. <laughs> anyway, my guest today is Jim Bogus. He is the drummer of the Counting Crows, a very old friend of mine. He's also played in the Dixie Chicks, Ben Folds, uh, when Ben Folds split from Ben Folds 5. He played with Ben Folds and Cheryl Crow and all of these uh Acts are humongous, and he's been the drummer for all of them. He's a permanent member now of the County Crows for 14 years. He also played in the uh, on the super masterpiece record Lone Mountain Serenade by your yours truly, Mr. Dean Del Rey, available on iTunes, and uh, an East Bay guy. East Bay guy played Papa's Culture. If you're a, a, an East Bay nerd and you remember Papa's Culture, then boom, here you are finding yourself on a Tuesday morning about to hear an, an incredible episode. That's why I saved it. I did not want it to get slipped through the cracks. We had tried to do this podcast for three years and then it just fucking happens organically. 
And that's, I find that that's how uh, things work in life. You stress out like, fuck, I can't believe that fucking didn't happen. And then boom, randomly it happens. And that's what happened with this episode. I was just walking down the street home from the gym in New York. And I get a text. Did you just walk by me? I was like, what? He goes, I think you just walked by me. Are you in New York? And it was Jim. I go, yeah. And bam, it was hilarious. He didn't recognize me because I was skinny Dean. Skinny Dean, fuck sugar. <laughs> anyway, went to his hotel. We sat down and we fucking laughed our asses off. Jim has some great stories. He has an epic story about Keith Richards and Eric Clapton. You do not want to miss. Uh, a couple things before we get into the episode today is the two year anniversary of me being alive after the motorcycle crash. I uh, thought about that uh, yesterday as it was the two year anniversary and I was like, wow, like I said before, as I slid down the pavement, no regrets. I had no regrets. If that woman would have ran me over like a speed bump in the night. I'm all good. I would have been all good. But here I am. I'm here for some reason. And uh, fuck yeah. Two-year anniversary. I'm alive. Pretty cool. Uh, <laughs> just out of fucking nowhere. Let's see. I wanted to give you guys a couple, uh, couple shout-outs to uh, some donations. Here we go. My man who donated... Uh, on Patreon. If you want to donate, go to patreon.com slash Dean Del Rey and donate. Mark T. Simpson, thank you so much for the donation. Fucking cool. Patreon donation. I love it. Also, I want to give a thank you to The Stand in New York City. A 100% big shout out to The Stand for all the support and, and an excellent month in New York. I'm back in LA now. And, uh, Thank you, The Stand, everybody that works there, and all my friends. Aaron Berg, congrats on your, uh, you and your lady, on your daughter, Piper, brand new baby, comedian Aaron Berg. You'll hear him here in a couple weeks. And uh, thanks, everybody else out there. It was great seeing Big J uh, and, uh, you know, uh, Ari, all kinds of friends, new and old. I loved it. Uh, what else we got? We lost Walter Becker, man. I could not fucking believe it. Walter Becker, I think he was, uh, what, 66 years old. We lost him on Sunday. Steely Dan, one of my favorite bands of all time. I've seen him three times. Uh, the first time was in the early 90s after they had not toured in about 100 years. I went to the Conquer Pavilion, watched Steely Dan, and it fucking blew my mind. I also saw him at Coachella which was so great to see just a fucking field of hipsters watching people play instruments. That was beautiful. And then I saw him, uh, Adam and I, Adam eBay, eBay Adam, from the store. We went and saw him at the Hollywood Bowl last year with Elvis Costello. And that was probably one of the best times I've seen him. Uh, Walter, just an incredible songwriter. An amazing guitar collection. I've seen him whip out Karina V's and Karina Explores and, and fucking Les Paul's. And those two together, uh, you know, write some of the best music I've ever heard. And I, I've coined it cocaine jazz. Every time I hear it, I think of like the late 70s, somebody just whiffing rails, cruising in a Porsche 911 down Sunset. Ricky, don't lose that number. Fucking great. Anyway, before I get into the guest real quick, thank you to my man, Bill Burr. What a fucking legend that man is. On Saturday, he invited me to, to feature for him in San Diego. If anybody knows the California traffic, uh, it is absolutely brutal. If you've got a gig in San Diego, you think... Holy shit, it's only two hours away, but it's really five because of the traffic, especially on a three-day weekend. And it's almost like, should we fly a 20, 30-minute flight? That's how ridiculous the traffic is in this town. And uh, he said, you want to open? I said, absolutely. Uh, he said, meet me over here at the Burbank Airport. We're going to take a helicopter. I was like, fucking, this is cool. I get there, and I realize... 
Bill Burr is flying the helicopter. He's got his license, and he's been working on it for a couple of years. But here, I told him, too, I'd go, oh, I'll go up with you anytime. Let's do it. Just fucking shooting my mouth off. And then there we were in this fucking super helicopter that held six people. And uh, it was like just the limousine of fucking helicopters. And I got in. And I got to say, man, for a couple minutes, I was like, yeah, Bill is one of my great friends. Super, super close friend. And one of the greatest comics of all, all, all time. But I'm like, but, but how's his helicopter skills? <laughs> it started going through my mind, man. And I'd never been in a helicopter. I cannot believe it. Bucket list. 51 years old. I've done it. I thought I did everything. Never been in a helicopter. He fucking fires that thing up. And helicopters are weird, man. You're in them, and they, they, as they start to take off, it's just kind of like they kind of dip left and right and front and center. You're like, whoa, whoa, whoa this thing's fuck. I mean, it's so funny because they've been around forever, but you still think of a helicopter as just some fucking thing a, a dude made in his backyard, <laughs> you know? But we lift it off. This thing goes 100 and f- I think he said 35 miles an hour. We lifted off. We flew over the fucking uh, Hollywood sign right over my old neighborhood, Beechwood Canyon. And I was I was scared for a minute. And then and then I slipped into ah fuck it. If I go, this is a great way. You know what I mean? This is a great way. (laughs) What a story. Right. Fuck. They were going to a gig, man. I mean, you know, it, it was just beautiful is what I was saying. It was kind of just fucking heaven. And then we flew over Los Feliz over the Frank Lloyd Wright Ennis house. And I was like, holy shit. Then we went over Dodger Stadium. Dodger Stadium looked beautiful. And I hate the Dodgers. It just looked beautiful from the sky. Zipped around uh, downtown. Got onto the coastline of Long Beach. And soared all the way up the coastline over Hermosa Beach. Huntington Beach. And uh, all the rich areas, man, looking at mansions. And to me, it was like an architecture tour, man. I love architecture. And I was losing my mind, like, look at those fucking houses. Next thing you know, we're fucking pulling in. 56 minutes. 56 minutes from Burbank to uh, San Diego, man. It was insane. We stepped on the stage, did the show, which was an incredible audience. I mean, incredible at this casino, Harris Casino. Got back in the helicopter. We were back at 11 o'clock. I was eating eating gluten-free pizza at 1130. And I I couldn't sleep all night. I told Bill. I was buzzing. It was so fucking cool. Nighttime was scary because this helicopter had... um, floor to ceiling windows so at night you couldn't see the glass so it looked like you were just hanging hanging there like the military how they open the sides you know oh my god it was i still i'm smiling right now telling you guys about it it was just amazing uh anyway thank you bill i will never fucking forget that uh let's see gigs coming up this weekend with bill uh, Mississippi and Alabama go to my website and see that most important if you do live in LA I'm headlining Wednesday this Wednesday at the Bray Improv and I really want you guys to come out man I want to run this long set and uh, I know it's after a three day week and I, I didn't even think about that when I booked it and I'm like oh fuck people are going to be like I'm kind of burnt man but uh, please come out spread the word tweet about it Wednesday uh, this Wednesday at the Bray Improv uh, speaking of that, I want to tell you guys, uh, before we get into it, I want to shout out to my incredible sponsors, Catatonic. Uh, if you, if you know anything, uh, about my, my merch, my stickers and everything, Catatonic's the one that does it. If you need, uh, like some rock and roll stickers or you're a small business or anything like that. Go to Catatonic, man. Check them out. They'll make your stickers. They can make uh, any kind of art for you. They can make toys for you. This this guy is over the top. Go to his website and see what I'm talking about. Catatonic.com. C-A-D-A-T-O-N-I-C.com. Catatonic, your one-stop shop for all kinds of great stuff. Christmas coming up. 
anything you can draw on a napkin, they can do uh, 3D digital modeling. They also do 3D printing, resins, metals, ceramics, high and low volume casting, painting, precious metal printing. This guy's fucking over the top, his art, man. And uh, he can help you out. Stickers, merch, anything you need, man. My boy Spicer's using them. I think Kevin Christie hit him up. Great, great guy. Great company. Check him out, catatonic.com. And also, speaking of Bill Burr, on Saturday, my boys from El Cajon Harley came. Brett and Ry- uh, Brett and Ry- uh, Greg Riley. Brett, 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 Brett. Uh, those guys came down, and we're going to do a podcast with El Cajon Harley. I'm going to go ride these new Harleys, hopefully this week. And we're going to sit down and talk about them. Uh, Cat- uh, Catatonic and El Cajon Harley, incredible sponsors. Hit up El Cajon Harley. Go down and test ride one of these new bikes yourself. Hit them up at ElCajonHarley.com. Follow them on Instagram or Twitter. And uh, tell them I sent you. I just uh, talked to a couple dudes that bought bikes, and they didn't go there. I was fucking, I can't believe it. they just like, what are you, dumb? Don't you want to be treated right? Don't you want to go to a dealer that rocks? Go to El Cajon Harley. All right, I love you guys. Let's get into it right now. Here he is right here, my good friend and yours, Jim Bogus. Candles lit. Jim Bogus, here we are. How fucking <laughs> New York City. So fucking weird trying to get you on the show for like three years, and then I'm yeah. walking down... Uh, the street here in New York, and you text me and say, hey, are you in New York? I say, yeah. You go, you just walked right by me. It's so funny because like, I lost weight, so you didn't say anything. Yeah, if people, if people are just listening to you on the podcast or whatever and haven't seen you, like I haven't seen you, and, and, and most of the pictures are still with, with yeah. weight, you know? Yep. I yeah, that's because of lazy promoters. Lazy promoters. <laughs> You know what I mean? You give them about 40 photos, and then uh, they just go, let's use that one from uh, six years ago. And you show up at the club, and you're like, really, man? You know? <laughs> you know what I mean? We haven't done any photos forever in, in Counting Crows. Yeah. And when, when I first joined the band, they didn't do any photos. And, and for, for a while, I was just like, okay, with signing the picture of the other drummer. Oh, you know? and the then, worst. And then, and then I started to draw a stick guy, you know? And I was like, hey, man, are we... Well, actually, it was my fault because, yeah. because we booked a photo shoot right when I was joining and I had a gig with Sheryl Crow. Oh. And I was like, oh, I can't make it. Like, I'm not going to miss out on... Yeah, yeah, st- money for a photo. Yeah, for a photo shoot. Yeah. But, but little did I know it would be years before we would, oh, we would do photos again. And then we haven't since since then so the photos are all yeah yeah they're old man let's let's get in a little right. bit into it like you okay uh if people don't know you played in dixie chicks yeah. cheryl crow yeah. ben folds five well it was just ben folds it was when oh yeah it was yeah when he got rid of uh yeah the five it was his solo thing right i remember that and then counting crows so uh it's pretty yeah pr- it's pretty interesting, especially a guy told me two days ago, it was funny where I was walking down the street and he said, you seen that, um, that documentary Sidemen, I think it's called Sidemen or whatever. Uh, it's a new one out. It's got like uh-huh. Rudy Sarzo and these guys that play with uh, different bands all their lives. And for years you think, oh man, I wish I had my own band, you know, a lot of these side guys. And now in this uh, landscape of the business, you're the winner. Because at least you're getting some salary, you know what I'm saying? Because because you're going to get paid, uh, you know, the record comes out, maybe th- there's no record sales anymore. Before you'd be like, oh, I want to be on, I want to, you know, have right. my own record. But how now, long has it been? You just put out the record so you can tour. Yeah, now yeah. nobody gives a fuck about the records and it's just all about touring. So then you get, a, a, you get a paycheck and you get to play drums all your life. You know, a lot of people don't. I like to be, I'm a band guy though. I right. only went the sideman route because my band... In a perfect world, you know, the band I was in in the Bay Area, Papa's Culture, would have made it, and, and that didn't happen. But, uh, you know, and at a certain point, it was like, okay, I have to go a different route to get to the places I want to go. Although, those years with that band was great. I mean, how do you measure, measure success, you know? it's like Oh, exactly. We were, we were making a living and playing great music. I, I was... You know. And you're not even thinking about money, you know no. what I mean? Because when you're selling out, like you know, the Berkeley Square and the Stone to me, and and the and the, you know, 
uh, the starry plow and you're playing at your college and stuff. Yeah. And, and there's fucking tons of people there. It really feels like you have made it, you know, compared to like if you try to get something going now and you're like, no one will come. <laughs> no one comes out. You just you know? keep up in the ante. Yeah. I mean, I remember in the Bay, it's like, man, if I could just play Slims, yeah. I've made it, you know? Yeah. And then you get to Slims and it's like, well, shit, maybe what about the Fillmore over there? Yeah, you know? yeah or the Warfield. <laughs> right. That was the crown jewel, the Warfield. When, you know? when, when, when I first toured with Cheryl and we did our hometown show there, it was just... You know, and she knew it was a big deal for me and, and she let me even sing lead on a song. Yeah. And, and then we played the... The Paramount in Oakland. Uh, I, I, and, I did that too. It's incredible, yeah. right? And 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 I worked at the music store right across the street, right there on Broadway. Best music for yeah. years, you know. Yeah. And 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 the guys that were there, you know, still at the drum store, schlepping downstairs. And 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 uh, you know, I went through the store, and they were like, "Man, you know, you're the you you give us hope because we know that you went and did the same things that we're doing right now." And that's yeah. what. Everybody wants to hear, you know, like when, when our mutual friend, David Immergluck, who plays in County Crows, when he got the gig with Hyatt and he was on Letterman, you know, we played in all these bands and seeing him, it was like he was representing all yeah. of us. And it was Your like, buddy man, on, if buddy he can do it, I Letterman. can do it. Especially yeah. back then, man. You know, now these shows need uh, content. So everybody's yeah. on TV. I yeah. mean, like I can get on TV. You know what I'm saying? It's like people get on TV. But back then, man... To be on TV, Letterman at its peak, or uh, even a, a Johnny Carson uh, before that or whatever, that was like, holy shit, man, right. you're on fucking Letterman, you know? Did you see anybody at the Paramount? Because to me, I remember, I think it was around 96, I saw Chris Rock in there. I've seen many things in there, including some of the best shows ever. Tom Waits, one of the best shows I've ever seen in my life in there. Right. But I saw Chris Rock in there. And to come back and do the Paramount was so fucking crazy full circle to me because yeah. I was thinking like, no way in 96 was I sitting there going, I'm going to be doing comedy one day and I'll be in here. You know what I mean? And when I walked on that stage, it was fucking like jumping out of an airplane. The adrenaline and everything was insane. You That's know? what it's all about. Yeah. I remember going back and playing in the war field uh, about a year ago. I played it as a kid. And it seemed huge opening for Bad English when I was a kid. Right. It seemed huge. Right. Went back, did it in comedy. I go, oh, this thing's not big at all. No, I did the same thing. Because right. we had been out with Cheryl a bunch. And then, you know, the places look a lot better when it's dark. And oh, that's yeah. when you usually see a show. So we had played a whole bunch of venues. And we went in for the sound check. And, you know, the lights are on. And I'm looking around. I'm like, man this place is kind of a dump, you know? <laughs> <laughs> you know, like, yeah, you know right? bite your tongue. I mean, I would have given, you know, one of my limbs oh to my play God, there yeah. back in the day, but you just, you got to keep yourself in check, you know? Yeah. You're, 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 you're flying to some gig and you're like, this seat sucks, I'm not in business class. And then it's like, wait a minute, yeah. you know? To fly to a gig, you know, I mean, yeah, I would have fly to a gig. I, I back in the done, day, yeah, I would have, yeah. I would have ran behind the the van on my skateboard back in yeah. the day, which is, I think, is the only way that you ever put up with all the bullshit to even get anywhere because, because you love it. And it's like, you know, like I was telling someone the other day, it's like, you know, being in this business and I'm sure the same for you. It's like, you know, it's like getting hit in the stomach and getting the wind knocked out of you and you keep getting up to get yeah. hit again. You know, it's, yeah, yeah. it's like success or death, like get to the places you want to go yep. or, or die trying. Well, that's why 99% tap out. You know what I mean? Yeah. After you get punched a few times, you go, I'm out. And, and I always say nothing takes a, an artist out quicker than a $30,000 a year job. You know what I mean? All <laughs> yeah. of a sudden they go, hey, dude, I got, I got benefits, you know, and uh, I, got, I got a paycheck. And, and life changes. People get different yep. priorities. And, totally. and, and I understand that. And that's why it's not in the cards for everyone. But yeah. for me, I was like, well, I'm going to give this a certain amount of time. And, you know, I didn't get married till later, all that stuff. It was all music and everything i grabbed was more music and and being a drummer as you said like the side man you can you can wear these different hats and and that just increases your odds if you're a singer like what you did yeah you know that's it that's the one you know and it's hard enough but at least in, in any kind of music but at least if you're 
if you're a musician Drummers and you're and a drummer, can you can pop around. You can you can do a lot. You know, country gym dog. You know, yeah, yeah. hard rock. You know, like yeah, 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 I mean, yeah, what? yeah, yeah. Jazz dog, <laughs> yeah. glider, <laughs> whatever, whatever it calls for. And then yeah. and then I always talk about irons in the fire. That's what I. You know, you have all these irons in the fire, and yeah. if one catches flame, you you go with that. But the more you have, you know, going, the yeah. better the odds are. Well, I, I look at sense. it as um, there's like there's times in my life that are uh, completely epic. One of them uh, working in the comedy store, you know, like I work there every night. There's nothing that really uh, comes close to that to me now. Uh, but then when I sit down and really think about it, there's and you talk about uh, monetary or people go fame, you know, oh, you never made it or anything. It's like, oh, but y you're wrong. You know what I mean? Like, I think back to when we're making that record at Coast and I'm doing my solo record. Yeah. And uh, the times of me, you, Emmer Gluck, Tori, uh, uh, Benson, Joey, that time. How many? We know so many people. You yeah, know, I mean, probably a lot of people with Delray, there's there's three degrees of separation. But yeah, yeah, but 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 being in that studio, a pro studio, making a 24 track record on tape, and the amount of laughs and fucking good times, those are the things that are like cocaine, man. They hit you and you just go, wow. When I drive by that studio, I was just in San Fran recently. I drive right. by, it's gone now, but I drive by and I go, wow, man, you know? It's those are the things that you'll never forget. And you can't really get those from just some nine to five job. You're not going to go five years ago. Remember that time when <laughs> I got the better cubicle? You know what I mean? You're never going to get that kind of shit. So yeah. it's just, I mean, here we are in New York City. I'm 51. I don't know how old you are. I'm, turning, I'm about to turn 50 soon. But our entire lives... We, we've been in the arts. Yeah. You know what I mean? Yeah. Our entire lives. And we sit without even knowing the two of us are in New York City. That, I mean, that fucking rocks me, that kind of shit. Yeah. You know what I mean? Yeah. And that's how small life really is. I'm walking down the street and you saw me today. You know what I mean? I it's, thought I saw, I was going to say something. And I'm like, this guy's going to be like, what are you, crazy? You know? <laughs> it was, it was, Bizarro Del Rey. Yeah, well, yeah, I had gym clothes on. I'm just walking from buying some fucking Jordans, you know. I'm just like, oh, look at this. Oh, here's my old candy store. <laughs> you know, I love that candy store. I can't go in there anymore, man. I mean, it went in for fun. I could smell it. Walking by, you can smell sugar. What Do you still collect the Pez? I mean, you don't have to eat them. You I don't collect, collect them, the right? Pez. I sold them all except for the like crazy rare ones because it was just too many, you know. I used to love uh, collecting those, though. I fucking had so many of them. Now, here we go. So you're playing, you grow up in Walnut Creek, right? Yeah, but we'll, Oakland, and, Oakland. Then, and then Walnut Creek later. So I'm this weird, you know, I yeah. really... East Bay, East Bay uh, yeah. pro. But, but, but I wouldn't have been the same person without, you know, the hardcore Oakland and the yeah. suburbia. And I really embraced both sides. But yeah, they yeah, had, like, yeah. a, a real effect on me, you know? I'm like this hardcore you know but then tennis playing you know yeah. i mean you know it would they, they both really had a, a profound yeah, yeah. effect on me but yeah and and i live in berkeley now and you're uh, you're living berkeley yeah. so you're, you're rocking this band um and and uh papa's culture Correct. blake lead singer right. and you guys are you're pretty good and stuff but then it kind of uh disappears when do you get the audition for cheryl how do you get that call okay well the, the papa's thing that was a great band, right? You know, I mean, the, I remember the, you guys the, did a record, right, for Modern. We Land? did a record for no, we did. We were signed with Elektra. Oh wow! And we had a record when I joined the band. It was it was signed with Elektra. We had a record coming out, and the label had no idea what to do with us. Oh yeah, you'd go in the record that's store. The, that's during the time of like Psycho Funk Puss, like kind of Berkeley music, right? Is as, as Faith No More. That kind of thing, you know, curveball, weird meat bands, right? It was right? before that. I mean, it was early 90s. Our record came out the same date that Counting Crows, August and Everything wow. After came so, out. Wow, so that's an interesting thing, too, because I often tell people, and I had Emmer on this show, Counting Crows, August and Everything After, one of my favorite records of all time. But, you know, everybody was like, hey, Dean, did you see them in the early days? I was like, these bands were like, like ghosts. 
All of a sudden, you're like, well, who the fuck is this band? Like Brendan Benson. You're like, How, who's this guy that's got a record deal? Or, or T-Ride. These bands that just all of a sudden seem to, they were Bay Area bands, but yeah. never saw them fucking once, you know? It's it's crazy. So that's interesting, you know? I mean, Papa's Culture, definitely, I, I knew who they were. They were out playing all the time. County Crows didn't gig around. Not at and, all. And I, and they were... They were uh, you know, he had another band. Adam had another band, yeah. and they just did some demos. And it probably would have never happened, but Dave Bryson yep. shopped those demos yeah. and got them a deal. And there was a bidding war, you know. And I got and a then, demo where they sound just like the Police. Exact. Oh, wow. I mean, exact to the Police. You're like, hmm. whoa, is this the Police? No, because before they're kind of what they are uh, on August and everything after. Uh, like he had an earlier thing, and it just sounded like the Police. Man, right. it's crazy. Right. So, so, so anyway, so both of our records came out. We both had sold out shows at Slim's and, and you'd go into the record store and one record store would have, you know, cause we were kind of all over the place. Pop's right. culture was like jazz, hip hop, reggae, rap, you know, it was just music to us. But back then, everything was really, you know, Categorized. you had to be, yeah, Grunge, exactly. hair metal. You'd, you'd go uh, in the record country. store, yeah. and it'd be in the reggae at yeah. one record store, the rap, the other, and they just, they didn't have any idea, idea what to do with us. And then, you know, you go into the mall to buy a pair of jeans, and in, in the bag would be a cassette of Mr. Jones. Yeah. And, and uh, Emmer was playing in both bands, and I was telling him, look, man, <laughs> you need to join that band, because yeah. I could see, I mean, the yeah. songs were great, they were great, but you could see the label was behind them, and you could, you oh, know, yeah. and, and oh, I, I, mean, I told him. He I stayed this, with us, he made the wrong move. I tell the story all the time. It's like, I remember, I'm just, I uh, come home from a gig, I was playing the uh, Paradise Lounge every Monday night doing a residency. Oh, I, I come. That. Yeah, right? I come home, I turn on the TV, I'm just kind of winding down, and they're all, brand new Bay Area band, Counting Crows on VH1. Mr. Jones comes on, I go, oh, that could be the best song I've heard in a long time, man. This is like the new fucking, uh, you know, it's like new, uh, you know... I, I, it was like a new sound, like the, the like the uh, Wallflowers were coming out with this right. thing, and it was like the, you know, this the band and 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 fucking uh, Van Morrison and like this organic thing. I was like, this is great, you know. And he immediately was like, oh, I'm kind of fucked. You know what I mean? <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Because it's like you're like, man, I got to learn how to write some songs. It's crazy. Yeah, it's that. I mean. Now I'm going forward, but that ultimately, when when I left Cheryl and joined Counting Crows, it was to be a band member. But the one thing I looked at was that those guys still write great songs, right? And that and they always have the catalog is really deep. And of course, when you have a record as big as August and everything after, yeah, yeah, and 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 also when people just relate to that record and have it as a moment of time, you're never going to top that. However, the band still writes great songs, and yeah. and and that's what it comes what it comes down to to me you know that's, well, that's he, why i made that move i look at uh i mean we're jumping way ahead here but when i get into the songwriting of this band you know i, I it's a typical typical thing of fans part-timer fans that are like whatever happened to that band when they say that about the wallflowers or counting crows like, yeah. what are you out of your fucking mind you ever heard the second record recovering the satellites that fucking thing is a smoker. And then the, uh, the Desert Life, yeah. that Four Days song, yeah. one of the best songs in the catalog, you know what I mean? And, 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 and what is it, Hard Candy? Like, each record has like two or three songs that I go, oh, fuck, man, it, this is great. It wasn't until we did Shrek and my nieces were jumping up and down yeah. on, the, on the bed to that one. All right, let me go back. So yeah, you were so saying how I got Papa's with the culture. Cheryl. You get dropped, obviously. We got dropped. We kept going. Yeah, you know? kept we going. Yeah, you know, for for a long time. And we used to, you know, to make a living, we would do weekly gigs, like you know, uh, Sunday night in Sacramento, oh, yeah. Wednesday night in Berkeley at the Jupiter, Friday night at the Elbow Room. Yeah, you know where I realized, and 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 at that time they only had jazz groups play there, but the but the club. Would would draw people, yeah, and then the band would draw people, and so I and and the guys were making money. Oh, that's the thing. Back then, man, we made money. You yeah. know what I mean? Like like our bands, you would just play like four nights a week, yeah. and make and, and rent in San Fran was like three fifty, right? And you were making crazy money. 
like at the Paradise, then you'd play that cork room on Mission, whatever the loved ones played. Uh, what were those guys? That place. There's just not as many places. To yeah, play yeah. Anymore. You play Mix Lounge on Van Ness. You know what I mean? These <laughs> these places. Uh, you know, I played Mix Lounge plenty of times. Yeah, yeah. With, New with Georges. You. you know what I mean? You yeah, start yeah. playing all these places, and there's actual money. If yeah. but the grind is brutal. That thing where you're doing two, three sets, and you're loading your shit out at like three in the morning, then you go to Sparky's till five. Look, I go home and I still do those kind of gigs. Yeah. I mean, because I love it, and yeah. that's. You know, people get to a certain level and then they won't, you know, haul their gear or do that. I don't care, man. Yeah, and, yeah, and, yeah. and there's, you know, you keep your chops up. There's only so many sessions I'm going to get in this and that in the Bay Area. Um, but but I'll go. I have a bar band, man. We'll play and, and I'll haul my drums out there and and, uh, and play till midnight and that's it's why great. I love, that's why I love comics, the biggest comics. They don't just go, I made it and then disappear. Like Louis C.K., Bill Burr, Marin, uh, Rogan, all these guys, uh, Chris Rock, Chappelle, you'll see them in these fucking spots all over the place, working right. shit uh, seven days a week. You yeah. know what I mean? It's like keeping fresh. Well, there's no substitute for that, for, for performing. Yeah. And I, and I could be at home practicing and doing things all I want, but, but what happens when you go out and play three or four hours a night there's yeah. no substitute for that. And when and when I'm doing that and then we go on the road, there's no warming up for me, man. I'm ready to go. Yeah, yeah. And a two hour show is like nothing, you know, yeah. compared to what yeah. I've been doing. I don't even have to haul my drums. Yeah, know? yeah, right. Like, it's, just, it's great. You just back there and then you walk on. But that's an interesting thing too, because people don't understand is like once you get to a certain level, you might just play three gigs a week or something, or four as a on a pro level of right. like counting crows. And then, you know, other guys could get rusty. Like they're like well i haven't fucking how does that song even go and you're like what do you mean it goes room 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 and you're over there right you got to keep you got to yeah. keep your chops up i mean yeah. my, my dad would always my dad was a trumpet player in the san francisco symphony for like 49 years and he would always you know when i would come back from the road the first thing he'd say on you know on the I'd pick up the phone, I'm going to call him, and the first question he'd say, are you practicing? It's like, yeah, dad, I'm pra you know, if you're not practicing, somebody else is, but you know, just keeping your, yeah. your chops honed and, and always staying on top of things, and that's the way, uh, that's the way he was. So. so the band's rolling, and you guys, are, you guys can see, are you trying to get another deal, or are you guys doing yeah, demos and all that? it just kind of fizzled out, I don't know, you know, we, 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 we kept it going a long time, right. and, and then... Um, Immer Gluck had done a session with Sheryl Crow. And On the second record, right? Yes. Right. And this was when the second record was about to come out. Right. And Urbano, Michael Urbano, a Bay Area drummer who's yep. played on a million things. And, he played you know, with, uh, what was that band? The, the One Forever. Uh, oh, did he play with Walking on the Moon? Yes. Yeah. Yes. What do they call him? Yeah. He played with them. He, he played He was Cracker, actually a member. Cracker. Hyatt. He was like the top fucking gun for years, yeah. right? It was weird. And then it kind of seemed like Josh Freeze came in and just kind of took all the stuff. There's, everyone has their time. But, yep. but, but Michael... I think more than anybody in the Bay Area, as far as drummers, I looked up to him. Yeah. Be like Mike, you know? It was like, this is the guy. And, and um, he had recommended me, and I didn't even know him. And then that was like, Cheryl heard my name one too many times, and she was like, okay, I got to get this guy in here. And I had, I had never really met Michael, you know, but he'd see me play with Papa's Culture in the, right. in the, in the clubs. And the night before I was flying to L.A. to audition with Cheryl... Oh, you audition in L.A.? Yeah. Okay. He, ca he calls me up. Yeah. And, and we're talking, and, you know, I'm talking about this record he did and that, and, and you know, oh, I really love this song that you played. Uh, it was this Walk On, the, the title track on the Hyatt record. Oh, you know, I love it. The groove it. Walk was on. so deep. Great record. Yeah. And, and just that title track, it's a ballad, but it, it was my favorite song and just the drumming on it. And he was like, oh, yeah, that's, that's my favorite, too. And, I'm, uh, you know, we're talking, talking. And then finally near the end of the conversation, he goes, you know, I hope this thing works out with Cheryl. I, I'm, I'm convinced that it's just a matter of time before you break a gig if it's not this one. And right. to, to hear that wow. from like someone that you looked up to so much, right, it, gave right. this, it gave me all this confidence going in the next day. So, so you fly into LA. How many songs you got to learn? Well, it, it, like these things usually go, it's, it's, it's last minute, and they just had a couple songs from the, from the record that was coming out. Wow. But, but, and, and I had like a day and a half to prepare, 
and maybe two days. And then it was maybe three or four songs. But what, what I did was, was it like you, when it makes you, if it makes you happy or yeah, my favorite yeah. mistake, things like that. Yeah, no, yeah. no favorite mistake hadn't come out yet. Oh, is that, that, that was a, that was a later record. Oh, is it what's on that record? There's some great it makes shit. you happy. Every day is a winding road. Oh, yeah. Change. Oh uh, yeah. There was a lot of man. I don't even remember. But anyway, it's a great record. So, so what I did, I had a session booked. Yeah. And and I decided, man, you know, like these opportunities only come up once in a while. So I sessions come and go. So I called the people and I told them what was going on because my idea was to spend every moment I had till I have to fly down there, right? Working on the material, and and this is where you know being schooled a little bit and being able to write charts comes in because I went and charted because you're not going to learn the whole first record, even though they didn't ask for that. Right. I just thought. You know what are we gonna do Fuck after yeah. we play these songs? So I so I I charted out the whole first record, you know. Then learned the other songs, and when I went in there to audition after we got done with the tunes, of course she's like, "Oh, we're gonna play some songs from the first record. We know you don't know these, but yeah. just kind of play along." And I'm like, "Bam, bam!" Yeah, you know, yeah, I'm hitting yeah. all the stuff. I've got my chart. Yeah, and, you know, I could thank my dad. Who's in for the that. Ba- band at the time? Stroud. It, no, Stroud came later, man. He did? Years I later. I thought he was yeah. in fucking no. from the second Jeff record. Jeff Trot. Jeff Trot. Yeah, because he, he's always written with her, and he right. co-wrote that record. Is that the guy that died? No. Oh. That's... that's What's like, that guy's name? Uh, <laughs> he's from the first record, Kevin though. Gilbert. Right, 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 yeah, right, yeah, right, yeah. right, right. That's the first record. That's the Tuesday Night Music Club. Right, right. And then she got together with Jeff, and they did most that's of right. the co-writing. And then... Jeff has been her like writing partner on and Bill you know, Betrell. Ever since. He yeah. came in and produced that back. second one. Yeah, he came back. He came back. He did the first one. Yeah, and, and then he came back and worked right, on that one. Right, right, right. Uh, not on that one. On a later one. Oh, really? Yeah, but there was a lot of backlash from that first record because Absolutely. because there was all this you know collaboration. And then, you know, King she got Cheryl the, Crow. Right. The and, music club is like, we don't need these guys. And that's a record company move also. Promote the girl that, uh, you know. Well, when, when the record was done, <laughs> here's the thing, though. That, that record almost became a bargain bin because right. she was out there in a van, put a band together and was working that record. And every song they put out, it was nothing. But, you know, nothing was happening. And then right before they were just going to pack it up, they decided we'll put out one more song that almost didn't make the record that was sort of a joke song. Right. And it was all I want to do. Yeah. And then that blew up. And then they re-released after that, Leaving Las Vegas, uh, Can't Cry Anymore. But but they had already released those songs before and they it did nothing. Done. It was it done. It was done. She was this, you know. It's I'm always that story. Up, you know, that- it's always that story, right? It was done. Or this is the one I always hear on this show. We weren't even going to do that song. Yeah. And then the label said, we need one more. And we said, how about this thing? And it becomes the fucking 10 million seller. Who, who knows? So when she's out touring in the van, the mu- <clears throat> Tuesday Night Music Club are like, we're not they're going They're not out going in the van. In the van. Right, yeah, right? they're not they're doing any of that. They're fucking session dudes. And then when it, when it happened, there was a lot of sour grapes over like who is you know, getting the credit. And the, 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 the real thing, at least from what I could see, you know, going in and hearing all the stuff... Was that everybody right. contributed? Of you course. know, and it, and it wasn't that she wasn't the goods, and and that these other guys, all of them contributed, yeah. and then she kept it going. Um, but that second record, it was like she was trying to tell the world, you it's know, just me. I'm the shit. She starts and, playing bass, yeah. right? Yeah, and 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 we're there trying to prove it with her. So we're playing. I mean, and I had never been on tour like that. Yeah. So we're playing, you know, five nights a week. I mean, you don't, I mean, literally five nights a week, one night off and, and, and we're out for 10, 12 weeks at a time without right. a break. I mean, it was like, it was insane. And it's smashing, right? It's yeah. like, oh man, when it, when it took off, I mean, literally like, okay, I got, I'm, I'm, I'm going forward again. We're moving all over the place. But when I, when I went down there to LA, I got to talk about getting the gig. Oh yeah. There was. I'm waiting and I'm seeing all these like famous drummers come out of the door. Like, oh, so, oh you go, so, so you go in and oh, you're waiting in the waiting room well, and like, guys are coming can, out. Yeah, and I'm yeah. just like, oh, you know, and it's just making me more nervous. Who's coming out of there? I, you know, this guy from Simple Minds, all these right. different right, just, right. just guys. You That's got to be brutal. I can't say who I beat out in the audition, oh. Del Rey. <laughs> oh, yeah, yeah. 
No, but I get it. There's, there's so many things that fucking uh, matter in an audition. Yeah. When a guy comes in, is he going to be a $5,000 a week guy? Or is, it, is he going to be a dick? Is this guy a drinker? Right. I heard this guy's hard to work with. This guy's tempo's weird. All this fucking shit, dude. And it's, and it's pressure. You know, yeah. you're... you're auditioning is never fun and that's nope. why i think like the the more that you're prepared the better off you're going to be under that pressure situation totally. you know which was the case with me but the the good news for me was that once i was in the room it was a couple people in a room playing music it's what we've done our whole lives totally. you know there may be more zeros in the check and 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 whatever but you're just playing music i'm grabbing the mic i'm singing backup i'm doing yeah. the things and they're like hey who is this kid and Cheryl saw something in me. And, At the uh, audition, is she playing bass or no, acoustic? No, she hadn't started to do bass till later on. She's just playing keyboards and guitar. Yeah, because there's... The, did Jeff Trotter... Who played bass and keys? It seemed like a time where there's... We, we, there was rotating, a tour right, where people right. were rotating, which was that. a lot of fun for me. Yeah. It, not, uh, you know, it wasn't fun at all. <laughs> like all these different bass players. Yeah, it's different like, okay, feels. come on, man. Hey, the kick patterns here, that shit. Yeah, I get it. So, so <laughs> I played with a bunch of people, not Jeff Trot at this first. And oh, here's another side story. Immer was at the audition with me. He was? What yes. was he doing there? Play, uh, auditioning for guitar. Oh, wow. Yeah. And he come, Immer shows up late. He doesn't know the songs. Oh, you know, it's oh, like a total hammer. Yeah, total total hammer. You know? Oh, that's in C, right? And then he just comes out. Then he'll just throw in his slide. But he'd have these moments where it sounded great. Yeah, you know, yeah. it's like yeah. he's like, on 20. But you only have that one, you know, the yeah. one moment to to so so we did the audition and um and then we took off. Got a burrito or whatever. This is before cell phones and all that right, stuff. Right. We we get to the airport. We get we go back to uh, Burbank. Yeah, and Burbank to Oakland. Uh, yep. it's still that way. But uh, so Immer checks his his phone machine, and it's all messages with them looking for me. Oh, <laughs> really? <laughs> yeah, really? Yeah. Uh, if you're still with Jim, have him call this number. You know, so. So I and the same thing on my machine and yeah. and so I I I call them and they from the say, airport from the airport and they say you know we want you to play with some other people and uh, so they pick me up Immer flies back to uh, wow. to Oakland I'm yeah. like see you buddy yeah yeah, um, yeah and then I go in and play with some more people and this time it's Jeff Trot and Tim Smith the bass player yep. who, you know from Jellyfish yeah. who ended up being in the band and Jeff who like co-wrote these records sounds amazing i'm like who is this guy and, and after the audition i talked to him and he's like yeah i, I co-wrote the record and i'm like well why are you auditioning you know and yeah. he's like well they want to find the right you know mix and group of people so so then they drive me back to the airport i uh i same check day? my messages same same day yeah it's night now i check my messages this time it's cheryl yeah and she's like hey jim you know uh call me if it's not too late, if you get this and you know, I immediately call, I got to get all my change out. Yeah. And, uh, this time, uh, it's her phone machine. Hey Cheryl, you know, I'm, I, I'm about to go into Oakland. I'll call you when I get in, get into Oakland. Same thing. It's her phone machine. You know, call me, call me Cheryl. The worst. And then the, I think I have the gig, but I don't know. Yeah. And the whole weekend goes by. I can't sleep. Oh. I can't eat. Oh. I'm just, you know, I'm calling. No call back. I'm calling all my friends. Like, what do I do? And you know, they're, they're like, okay, just just hold tight. And if Monday rolls around, you don't hear anything, then call. Give, again. give the management a call and just say you're checking in because you have some other things going on and yeah, you weren't yeah. sure. So I did some that. Some bullshit. Yeah. Immediately, the manager calls and he's like, "You do want the gig, don't you?" And I'm like, "Yeah." Yeah. And he yeah. said, "Are you available for the next year and a half?" And I'm like, "Oh, I'm all, I'm all coy." Well, it's not that I. I can make myself available. Yeah, 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 yeah. So she was in Italy singing at some big thing with Pavarotti or, you know. Oh, yeah, yeah. The, so she was gone for the weekend. Yeah. So so then I get the gig. We do short amount of rehearsals. No warm-up gigs. First gig is 4th of July. 100,000 people under the arch in St. Louis. Oh, wow. Hold on. Now. Let's get into this because I yeah. always have guys on. It's your first time playing in a pro band. Well, I mean, I mean, I'm talking about no, but what I'm talking about is a touring band uh, where you need to negotiate salaries. Yeah, that's what I'm talking yeah, about. Yeah, Do you start calling guys and going, "Hey, what's the number here?" For sure. Yeah. I mean, I knew what the you know the the thing about Cheryl's management and and what I noticed 
back then, at least in a lot of rock and roll bands, in, in country it was a little different. And I found this out with the Dixie Chicks, but we'll get to that yeah. later. Yeah, yeah. They they had a price that was fair, and they paid everybody the same amount. And there was no like you in know rock people and going roll? around everybody. It, oh, that way, so you know the bus. You're like, whoa, you're getting that. I'm getting that's this. what happened with the Dixie Chicks. Wow. You know, I got everybody a raise because I because I made them pay me more. You know, yeah, yeah. <laughs> because I knew that the tour look. If it's not your first gig, you know, the only way you get paid what's fair, you, you see what the tour is selling and you know about the basis. And, yeah. And it's like the only way, if they're going to mess with you, the only way you're going to get what's fair is if you're willing to let the gig go. And there's so many people that will yeah. let the, you, you won't know, let that the won't gig let go. the gig go. Yeah, and we'll take just be whatever. The women boys. Yeah. And that's how we just, you know, musicians end up working against each other that way. You want what's fair. And you want to be fucking. Uh, like on the tour, you want a great vibe. You know what I mean? Right. Like this fucking bass player is getting more money than me. He hit like bad, five bad notes there. He doesn't even know the third song. And, and Cheryl, start keeping score. Cheryl always knew how to treat her people, and she paid us fair, and everybody made the same amount. And when we did a corporate gig, you know, because she's making extra money on that, yeah, she would pay us like a week a bonus a week's salary yeah. for the one gig to wow. give us all a taste wet our beak you know yeah 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 and, yeah and that was cool man and that's and that's why people stayed in her band i mean whenever you see an organization where people have been working for the artist for a long time there's something that's going on that's right you know in counting crows we have the same crew guys yeah you know same people when you see whether it's musicians or crew guys or whatever it is changing all the time, there's something wrong in that organization. I love when there's people that have been with an artist forever. That's yep. the way it should be. And, and I when I left Cheryl, it was to be a band member in Counting Crows. I wouldn't have just left. You know, I did other things when we were down. but Right, like Dixie Chicks? Yeah. Now, when, you're go when, you're, when Cheryl's down and you hear about Dixie Chicks, do you call and go, how long's the Dixie Chicks tour? Then you go, Cheryl, are you going to be doing anything? I might do the Dixie Chicks. It's exactly, okay. Because you're not on retainer with Cheryl, right? When, when the, we, we, as soon as the retainer ends, yeah. then I'm hustling for gigs. Right. It's, and if people don't know, retainer is when you're not playing for months at a time or sometimes a year, you keep getting uh, like half yeah. the money, right? Yeah, and it basically... This is how it all works, at least from my knowledge, or you know, being a side man. You get you get your 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 uh, your weekly salary, and then your retainer is whenever you're home or you're off, and it's half. Right. And then when a tour ends, you know, the thing with the retainer with Cheryl is we were always working, so it was like, yeah, know, like the retainer didn't do us much good. Yeah. Um, but you know, a little time when you're home, you get you get the retainer. Yeah, one week. Yeah. Uh, yeah. 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 Um, where was I? So the retainer ends and you say, hey, I'm going to oh, go oh, yeah. after what, a year and a half of the first tour? You, right. And then the thing is, with Cheryl, like I always got cuts on her record, but she uses a lot of different people in the studio. It's not just right. going to be one person. Right. And of course, I want to be the guy. That's just my nature. But the problem is you don't want to be sitting at home, at least for me, waiting for her to call. Like, when am I going to go in the studio? So I might have cost myself some recording because I would go and do other things. But it also showed, like, I'm not going to live or die by this gig. Right. I'm going to work. And, and things were rolling for me. Um, the, when the Dixie Chicks thing came along, they called me to recommend somebody. Really? They, they had played with us uh, on Lilith Fair. Oh, yeah. And, and, and they would sit in with us, and I was always There's really, an old word, Lilith Fair. Lilith Fair. Right? Yeah. Did you do Lilith Fair? Yeah. Wow. It was great. Yeah. Oh, fuck. One, one of the most successful tours. Dude, Lilith Fair was no joke. And that, I heard they're thinking about bringing it back. I hope so. Yeah, that thing was a mammoth. Although you know? it won't matter to me because I'm not working for any. Yeah, they, yeah. I mean, there was a time there, eight years, where I, re I was the drummer for the female stars. I mean, yeah. Sheryl Crow, Dixie Chicks, Stevie Nicks, Amy Grant. Wow. I mean, I played. You it, played it with just, Stevie Nicks? Yeah. Wow. I did, I did like a. a TV tour with her. It was all TV shows. Wow, uh, which was cool. You reach more people on those than, yeah. especially back in that. And so especially good for you when you get your face on TV constantly. Like, there's that guy again. Oh, that was Cheryl, man. Because yeah. I was, I do all the background vocals with her, and they would zoom in, and and you know, I had my hair bleached white and i was right behind her and yeah. we were just you know so it was like cheryl me You're cheryl just back me, there, if it the rest of the band <laughs> <They're> like, <"Yeah." laughs> so 
they call you and they yeah. say recommend and do you say well what about me i said beware cheap imitations oh. and then they were like well the, the girls are worried about stepping on cheryl's toes and i'm like stepping on her toes i'm not making it in a retainer you know so yeah so we get off the phone and i did exactly what you said which a lot of people wouldn't do uh you know although oh, just hear through the grapevine but you know i called cheryl and i said look this has come up you know what do you think and we were off, and she said, I think it's a great idea. Wow. And and when we got off the phone, she actually called Natalie and gave her blessing. Really? Yeah. Amazing. Yeah. So, and you hadn't even got the gig yet? Or well, they wanted me. Did you have to audition? No, because we'd played a bunch. Right. And, you know... They came and did the the Central Park concert we did. Right. They, you know, we were, you know, I'm playing, we're backing up Keith Richards. Hold on now. Clapton. Hold on now. Now, I don't know if you can tell this story, but I've told it many, many times. It is one of the most uh, legendary stories that have stuck in my mind, and my mind's pretty fried. The one where <laughs> Keith gives Eric Clapton oh, the watch back. Man. Can you tell that story? Uh, yeah, yeah, okay, yeah. Okay, good. Yeah. Because I've told this story, and I feel like when I tell people stories, I have, I've been on the road all my life, so have you. I've done all kinds of shit. And sometimes I feel like I don't even want to tell stories anymore because I feel like people think they're bullshit. So give this story, because I told Mary in this story and it's great <laughs> this your is not audition, bullshit <laughs> you're you're rehearsing for the central park gig which if people don't know cheryl crow played central park it was one of the biggest fucking gigs i think what was that in the 90s when was that yeah I, it had to be it was yeah. huge yeah it and, was a huge and, and, and we had filming. all the different artists play with us i mean the thing about cheryl she loved the legends and the legends loved her yeah so they would all come around but it wasn't just come around to hang they'd come around and sit in yeah so you get to play with with all the guys you grew up idolizing, yeah, and you know, run them down. You, Prince, Prince, Clapton, yeah, Keith Richards, yeah, Dylan, yeah, Elton John, wow, um, Dylan and Prince, yeah, I Keith. start, yeah, yeah, just all you yeah. know. I mean, it's so many people. Uh, uh, so she's Springsteen, gonna, Springsteen, you know, yeah, yeah, wow. Yeah. I just got a ticket today for the Broadway shows. Oh, my God. He's All playing right. like 20 nights on Broadway, 700 Whoa. seater. He's going to do like a storyteller show. I I'm, got one. I'm reading his book right now. So oh, yeah, yeah. Well, I just loaded it up on, uh, on my uh, phone today. It's awesome. Yeah, that guy's a god. So it, Okay, so you're rehearsing for the Central Park concert, and there's going to be all stars on this. Yeah, and and, you know... I don't. I mean, Keith. At this point, Keith and and Clapton hadn't spoken for forever. Yeah, yeah. I mean, there's just so much back. Stuff some kind of weird old shit. Relationships. I think it's over old ladies. Isn't it always over? Yeah, women? yeah, yeah. Or money. <laughs> money <laughs> or women. Tell. Pussy or cash. <laughs> <laughs> so true. There's no other battles. <laughs> That's what wars are fought over. <laughs> <laughs> Pussy or cash. You know what I mean? <laughs> now oil, but it's the same thing. That's yeah. cash. It it that's basically it. Yep. Yeah. So you're you're in uh you guys are rehearsing. We're we're rehearsing and we've done you know, they have it so they're separate, they're not they're not at the same time or anything. Because but they the, don't get along. Exactly. Right. But at the end of the night we're gonna do Tombstone Blues, yeah. Dylan. Yeah. And the last person to rehearse was Clapton. And we're hanging, you know, we we know him. He he you know, cause Cheryl, they were dating for a little bit and he would yeah. come out and sit in with us and, you know, we'd go to his house at dinner, just the nicest guy. I forgot I mean, they dated. That was yeah, crazy. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Yeah. So, so we know him and he's sitting on the drum riser and we're talking and then we start tombstone blues and Chrissy Hines there, a bunch of other people. And, and as we're playing the song, like a gunslinger from the other side of the stage, yeah. you know, it's just like the groove's like boom, tack, tack, at rehearsal, boom, right? Yeah, yeah. And we see Keith Richards on the other side of the stage with his guitar, just kind of going, don't, 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 don't. And he's doing, he's moving his, <laughs> yeah. his hips, you know, and he's just, he's just staring at Clapton. Wow, you know, like a gunslinger, and he's playing this yeah, little yeah. don't, tack, 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 and he just starts to slowly make a beeline towards Clapton. He's sitting on my drum riser, yeah, and yeah. and Clapton. Can feel him, can hear him, but yeah. he won't look at him. He's yeah. just staring straight ahead. He won't budge at all. <laughs> and then he's getting really close, and he's getting right on Clapton, you know, and he still won't even move. Yeah. And then the song has to stop because 
the teleprompters. Oh. You know, and, you know, for the verses. And then, you know, so we kind of stop and, and then Keith Richards is talking to us, you know, because Clapton won't look at him. And he's like, eh. You know, he starts bagging on the teleprompters. Does those things tell you how to rock and roll? You know, we're kind of <laughs> laughing. And then, uh, and then he, and then he grabs this, what I found out later was this old Rolex yeah, that yeah. had been a gift that Clapton gave him a long time. And he said, ah, you need this more than me. And he sticks it in Clapton's pocket. Fucking crazy. And Clapton still won't look at him. And yeah. I'm just, I'm, I'm like, I'm in, frozen in fear. Yeah, you know? yeah, and he's yeah. talking to us. Yeah. You know, this guy needs to lighten up. He's talking to me. Yeah, yeah. Telling Clapton needs to lighten up. And I'm like, yeah. And then he goes, he needs to have a drink. Yeah. And, and you know he's yeah. recovering. Yeah, he's recovering. Lighten up, and have I a think drink. his son had just died like a few years before that or whatever. Right? When, when he said that, I'm thinking, okay, they're not only they're gonna fight. Yeah, they're gonna. I'm gonna have to break up the rock god guitar fight. Yeah, yeah. And then before it could go any further, the song started again. And then and then it, it he ended just gave just him like that, that Rolex back. I never right in his pocket. Right in his pocket. Yeah, just like it's funny because you know what brought that up with me and Marin was. Um, Mar- uh, Marin had interviewed Keith Richards and he asked me to uh, be there on the phone, you know, like it was a phone interview. Uh-huh. He interviewed him face to face, but before that, about a year ago. And then Clapton played on the new Rolling Stones record. All right. Uh, recently, the blues one. Uh-huh. So I said, oh man, they must have made up, man. I heard a great fucking story from my boy who played drums. And I told him that story. Ah, you need this more than me. You, <laughs> you, don't, you don't have any danger in your playing. You yeah, need yeah. a drink. It'll help you keep time. Yeah, help stuff you keep like time. that. <laughs> you, know, you, need to, you need to lighten up and all this. I think he was saying some things about his... His oh. music, too. Oh, you know, my God, yeah. Too safe, too. Yeah, you know. fucking, you got no danger. I, I God. Just, I just remembered I was I was just in fear. I couldn't, yeah. I couldn't move. I just, I didn't <laughs> know what to do. To see that, though. To see that, like, to be behind the scenes and see how, how, like, you know he was home and went, where's that fucking Rolex he gave me? He <laughs> dug through an old fucking cabinet. Here it is. When I see him, I'm going to roll right up on him and give it back. You know what I mean? Yeah. I mean, first of all, Keith in a Rolex, I don't even see him ever wearing a watch, you know, he, like his whole thing. It's just like skull ring right, and, a fucking, right. and that bracelet from Talk is Cheap. That's all I've ever seen he, him, you know? He was the best on that. I remember, you know, that was just the rehearsal day of show, right. just kind of more like mix and stuff like that. We had one in a rehearsal studio before each artist came in to do their songs, and Cheryl was just she was really nervous and we were over rehearsing, you know, we were burnt yeah, yeah, yeah. and, you know, just like, yeah. you know, you leave, got it, leave, the, you... leave a little life left in the songs, please. So he comes in and he could just see we're burnt yeah. and he just starts playing blues and just, you know, and we're just jamming and he's telling stories. And then finally he's like, ah, what song are we playing? You know, we play happy. Yeah. And we're going to do that. The stone's Sick. happy. Yeah. And, um, we play it and then we get to the end and the end kind of, you know, it's a little sloppy ending, and then he's about to leave, and then Cheryl kind of goes, uh, shouldn't we go over that ending? And he just stops, and he goes, it's only rock and roll, baby. You know, and we all just start laughing, you know? Like, yeah. he, he could just see we were burnt. Yeah. And then and then the night of the show, he comes out, and if you, you see this, it's, it, it's uh, well, it's on a recording, it's on a live record. Yeah. But the first thing he says is, uh, you know, it's good to be here, it's good to be anywhere. Oh, I love that he one, He goes, yeah. let's hear it, let's hear it for the boys Back there in the band, they're doing all the work. Oh. That's the first thing he says. It's just like, man, wow. I just I want to get up there and kiss him. You know, he's, yeah, just, yeah. he's just the man. You get uh, like royalties, mechanicals or stuff from yeah. that record? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Not a lot, but yeah. you get a little, every once in a while you get a check and you're yeah, like, yeah. hey, oh, right. sushi. <laughs> I always I say. Mean, you know, the now that it, if, if you're not in on the writing, yeah. I, I mean, with Counting Crows, we do publishing is split three ways there's lyrics which is all adam there's music which is adam and maybe a guy or two in the band yep. and then a third is split amongst the band now back when you would sell a ton of records that would mean something Fuck now yeah, it's just well, kind of like yeah it's just a token now. it's a token yeah, but yeah. but but everything else is split so yeah. that's you know back in the day the the writers would make so much more than musicians. Jeff now, Trot, Rich. Yeah, we all make about the same. Yeah. So it's it's cool, I guess, for me. <laughs> I don't know. Now, once you go into Dixie Chicks, is that are you in the band during when all the hate happens? It was them? all before that. I I hit them just like with Cheryl. Like yeah. 
at their prime. I mean, I was with Cheryl for, for eight years. I'm but, talking about that stuff. Where, didn't Natalie say stuff about what it was? was... All, I was after I left. I was on the Fly Tour. Oh, okay. Oh, yeah. yeah I mean, when oh, they which could is do a great no record. Wrong, it, it's a great record. The Whoa. tour was amazing. Every show was sold out. Huge. I mean, even after a year. I saw them. I saw them. Uh, they yeah. opened for the Eagles at the Nokia Theater. See, and, that was later, yeah. Yeah, yeah. it was like the biggest fucking, you know, like, it was like, let's have the two biggest bands yeah. in the world play together. And I was like, these fucking guys, lay it down. So, so when, they, when they called me and then, okay, we want you to play the gig, and I heard about, you know, money-wise, sometimes it gets a little different in Nashville and some right. of the things in country. I, I don't know. This was my only experience with it. So the manager calls me up and... As I was saying before, this is how we do business in the rock. You have your you you agree upon your weekly salary, which is going to be based on you know how big the tour is, right? And then your retainer is your half salary when you're off, when you're at home, of course. And then whatever happens in the schedule, which we know it's going to change, that you have that set up, so it doesn't matter. That's all you need set up. So what they wanted to do, which I'd never heard about ever, was a lump sum. A lump sum. Yeah, a lump Just, sum. This is Here's what you get for the whole tour. tour. And I'm like, well, I can't, you know, so then I need to know the whole schedule. And oh, I need yeah, to know because, how we're playing so I can equal out what is a good amount oh, yeah, for a sold out arena. Yeah, because you're almost on this fucking like, okay, here's a, let's say it's 100 grand, but then you're doing 7,000 gigs. Exactly. That year. Yeah, yeah. Exactly. I mean, it was just, a, it's a bullshit chicken shit way to get you to play for less money, but right. I wasn't having it. Yeah. Because as much as I wanted to do that gig and I knew it was huge and I wanted it. I was not going to do it for, you know, it wasn't my first gig. Right, I was right. gonna I was going to get what was fair. And I knew they wanted me, too. Yeah. So, but, you know, you risk losing the gig. But of course. I, I, but I wasn't going to, I wasn't going to play for chump change or not what was fair. So I, I had them give me the whole schedule, painstakingly, like, did all the math, and then came to a lump sum that made sense with that tour. Right. And then, and this whole process took forever, Okay back and forth conversations like emails it was crazy and then finally we that's get, nuts that they don't just go let's get another guy in nashville he'll do it for this they want him the girls wanted me right you know, when, when when they when they played at the uh lilith fair yeah. i mean i would always rock out with natalie and at the end of the night i would be the drummer when everybody would play and, and we had we had a connection and they right you know like the guys in the cheryl band joked uh you know i want I want my tour to be like Cheryl's because they did a three screen thing that kind of reminded us of yeah. our tour. Yeah. Except for bigger and better. And fetch me that drummer boy. Uh -huh. and that, that, was a joke. <laughs> that was a joke going along in our camp. Well, what a lot of people don't know is um, whoever they had on drums before, and I don't know who it is and no knock to them, uh, but every, every fucking drummer is different. And I know that from, I played with five of the best sure. drummers in the planet. And each time a guy comes in, you go, oh, this guy's good too. Too, but oh, this is a different feel. And then this guy comes in, he lays back in the pocket. This right. guy pushes the songs. And whatever Natalie felt probably when she would jam with you was like, oh, this got something. You know what I mean? And so, when you feel that, you like especially with me, when I'd feel how songs go, and another guy would play them, I go, this is this this is how it goes, but it doesn't how it feels. Yeah, this is not how it feels. You yeah, know? yeah. So she might have got that taste. You know. I don't know, but I knew I knew they wanted me, and I was I was holding out. So yeah. we so we finally agree upon this lump sum, and everything is about to go down. And then and then right at the end of the conversation, the guy's like, "Well, of course, you know the tour is ending in October, but this if this sum is good for the remainder of the year." And then it's like two how, more months. How stupid! Yeah. I, you know, like if the so if the tour gets extended, yeah. I'm I'm basically playing, playing for free. free. You know, yeah. and I'm like I can't do that. You yeah, know, yeah, you yeah. gotta. You know, so so it's gotta be prorated. Then we're at a stalemate again. God. You know, so I think I'm not gonna get the tour. I don't hear anything. Then Natalie calls me, and she's yeah. like. And, and she's pretty straightforward. And she basically says, this is the phone call where I call and kiss your ass and tell you about how much we want you to play drums. And, uh, and I'm like, look, Natalie, there is nothing I want more than that. But I told her the problem. Yeah. And then she said, okay. So then they call back and they were going to, you know, prorate it if it goes longer, what the lump sum will equal per week. Yeah. And of course, lo and behold, what happens? 
The tour gets extended throughout the year. Yeah. And they have to pay me. Yeah. You know? And then when, when we first got into the tour, you know, I'm on the band with the bus. And of course, this is how unions are formed. We're talking about everything. And it ends up that I'm making more than the MD. Oh, no. And, and I'm really straightforward. The musical about director, the musical people director. don't know. Yeah. yeah. And, and I'm like, look, you know, this isn't right. And, and I said, look, if we stick together, they're not going to want our hire a whole new band. Right. And, you know, and we're not asking. We just want what's fair. Right. So Because at the time, this yeah. record is monstrous. <laughs> we're talking about one of the biggest records in the 90s, yeah. Fly. It was so fucking big, and they were so big, that they crossed and went full mainstream A Nashville three-girl Every country band. Every arena is sold out. Everyone. The tickets that they don't sell behind the stage... Those are sold. Yeah. I mean, every night. Every night. And so so we, I got the whole band raised. So I was the hero. Wow. You know? <laughs> yeah. Like, yeah, yeah, yeah. But that, you know, I knew if we stuck together, and that's basically forming a mini union. Yeah. Now, now, once you're doing the Dixie Chick, Cheryl starts fire fires back up, and then she doesn't uh, reuse you, right? No, she does. Oh, she does. Yeah, I was only, you know, we were on a break, and I, I was done you. with the Dixie Chicks before she started. Oh wow! Yeah. So, oh, I see. So that's why when you left Cheryl the second time, it was only because you were going to become a member of the Counting Crows. Exactly. Let's talk a little bit about that. Your uh, Counting Crows, of course, had Steve Bowman on drums, who was, uh, that's his name, right? Well, it was, it was Ben Mize. Right, but yeah, I mean, Steve, Steve was Bowman, original, right. Yeah, the area and, guy. and the guy was fucking smoking. He played with us. I was like, this guy's great. He owned yeah. the Red Devil Lounge for years. And, yeah. Uh, but, you know, you could see, like, uh, where some head button could go down. Exactly, but you know what happens when there's a band and then you get a bunch of success, there's always going to be a power struggle. Of course. And, and let me tell anybody, if you don't know, the singer's going to win the power struggle. Oh, oh yeah, the songwriter. <laughs> yeah, the songwriter and the yeah. singer, because singers rule. And yeah. you have to allow that to happen. I think you have to allow that to happen. Stuart you know, Copeland, a perfect yeah. example, plays in a three-piece band. Yeah. There's only two other guys he needs to get along with. He's one of the best drummers of all time, and he doesn't play in the police. You know what I mean? Now, yeah. I mean, like they don't well, play. You know, I'm just trying to give an yeah, example. You, you, yeah, you got to You got to yeah. let them. You also, know, you want to keep it close. You want to still have a say, but you have to let yeah. that happen. It's just, it's just the way it is. Well, what happens? And I find this in over, you know, hundreds of drummers I know, and every drummer I've ever had on here, and I've had some of the biggest. Uh, what happens is the drummer always get shortchanged on cash because they're not on the songwriting usually. So when they make some, uh, some you know, recommendations like, hey, how about you go to G chord there or whatever, and their ideas just get bystand, and then they start mm. getting angry in the back like, well, yeah, I'm not a songwriter because you don't even listen to my ideas or whatever, and then it starts to get heated, and it always comes down to songwriting and publishing. Uh, over those years, these drummers are starving out there, and the, you know what I mean? A lot of That's them. It's rough. It is rough. And, 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 and what I say is, if you look at all the drummers I've had on here, the bands, and somebody said this to me once, show me a great band and I'll show you the great drummer. There's mm. no great bands with a bad drummer. Well, it, 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 in, in pop music, I really feel like you have to have, if you have a bad drummer or a bad singer, it's game over. Because yeah. those things, they're, they're so important. It's not that every instrument isn't important but you can get away with some guy that's you know so yeah. so or riding Slag the wave or bass player but if if you if you have a drummer or singer and 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 someone that doesn't know music might not be able to put their finger on exactly what's wrong but you'll feel that there's something wrong and, yeah. and on the flip side you can really come into any situation and up the ante big time just because of the nature of the instrument yeah you know you can come in and play with the band or, absolutely you know, i mean drums and vocals rule and yep. you know it, you, you got to have that going on and they have to have a good rapport absolutely so bowman's out after the first uh is, is he out after the first record or does yeah. he play recovering the satellites no, he's out he okay. never even makes it through the tour right and then who comes in ben mize 
Who is that? I don't remember he was, him. He was a, you know, a guy from Athens, Georgia. They right. had just auditioned all these people. And as a matter of fact... Was he in Gigolo Ants? Oh, no, that's Fred. Yeah, that's yeah. Fred. Okay, Fred, good. who, did, who yep. also played with the Dixie, Dixie Chicks, Chicks after me. And Cheryl. And Cheryl. Yep. He's he in does Cheryl all, now. He does all my sloppy seconds. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> that's what I always tell Fred. Fred, you know, you're yeah. not going to get to County Crows, but you can... Yeah. He's, he was you know, in Wallflowers also. Yeah. Well, I didn't do that, but... Yeah, I know, but I'm just saying, like, it's that <laughs> infectious thing. All of us know each other and everybody, yeah. Right. So that guy's in for a while, and then why does he leave? Does he get fired? Because uh, I'm trying ben? To, Yeah, I'm trying to get how you get into the band. Ben had kids and just got tired of the road. But but when, when, when Bowman got axed or whatever uh, happened there... Uh, I wanted to get an audition. Of course. And Imra was in the band, and and I didn't get an audition. And later, when I did, and I got the gig, I, I couldn't help it. I asked Adam, man, hey, how come back in the day yeah. I didn't get in the audition? And what he said was, you know, because Adam is such a band guy, he yeah. was a fan of Papa's Culture. We opened up for them for Counting Crows of the Fillmore, Papa's right. Culture. Um, I have that poster. But anyways, uh, he didn't want to break up Papa's culture and I'm thinking don't oh. do me any favors we've already been dropped by our label you know I'm playing $100 gig yeah I don't want to wreck that yeah <laughs> well, thanks thanks, right. thanks for nothing yeah. you could have played on the recovery in the satellites right. tour. Oh, don't even yeah, yeah you know, right. hey, you can always go back and like that's if, the big if also had, wallflowers them toured together it was massive man I, I, I remember the last night was Conquer Pavilion they all wore fucking weird costumes like you know Fred Flintstone and Gumby and shit came out while wallflowers were playing <laughs> <laughs> hilarious a, a massive tour a massive yeah. tour i did a lot of tours with the wallflowers because we because they opened up for cheryl on a tour yeah and then we did a tour later with with county crows where they opened up so you finally get the call for uh for counting crows do, do you have to audition well, of course See, really? this is the other thing like and 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 bowman will tell you this and all these other guys you know you think you're gonna leave a gig and just join pearl jam the next day no one gives a shit. You know, it may get you in the door yeah. or, or something, but no one gives a shit what you've done before. You have to prove it all over again. You know, I was there like sh you know, learning all these counting crows. I'm, you know, I'm friends with Emmer Gluck, but I have to audition just like everybody else. And they're not even telling me the songs. It's just like, learn, you know, I'm learning all the records. I don't know what I'm going to have Whoa. to play. You don't even know what you're going to go in and audition to? No, no. Wow. And, and a lot of these people drummers and musicians will go into these auditions and these these auditions come around once in a lifetime yeah. if you're lucky because yep. they're they're serious things yeah. you know to, to to be a band member or something it's something that's been around <sighs> past 10 years yeah yeah what's been past 10 years and you know and what i mean i could see and when i looked at counting crows it was like look these guys could be like they're like a classic rock like Stones or Tom Petty on a smaller level, Good but time. that you can grow older and keep playing. Yeah. And and their songs are still great and it's it's something that you could see continuing. Right. So you don't you don't take that lightly. And and it's also to be in a band again where I'm playing the whole record. I'm not looking over my shoulder. Are you playing on the record? On the records? Counting Crows? Yeah, I didn't Always. know. Always. Yeah, uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. I mean yeah. that was I'm the guy. I mean yeah, from yeah, the moment yeah. I went in, you know, and that's that's uh that was what it was all about to me. And Cheryl, you know, she knew, she knew that, uh, you know, she was a side person. She was a side singer for Michael Jackson, right. Don Henley. She knew what it meant to be a band member. So she was very understanding. So I, so I went in, I auditioned, you know, a whole bunch of people. We auditioned at a, a radio show in Chicago. I forget the, you know, but the only other time that I've, played with some of these guys was when Adam and Charlie, the keyboard player in Counting Crows, came out when we were doing the same gig with Cheryl. Right. And they sat in with us. Wow. On this at the same place on the same date a couple years later. That's when I'm auditioning for Counting Crows while they're doing that same gig, which was really weird. Wait, so me. you're auditioning do they have a drummer and you're just like Ben that? is leaving. Oh okay, so yeah. at sound checks they're auditioning guys? Exactly. Whoa, that's nuts. Yeah. Now Here's my big, big fucking uh, question for you is, and, and, and it's, I think I'm, I'm, I, I, there's been no uh, secret that 
I love the records. I, I don't like how the, the live shows go because I don't know what song's being played. It's a lot <laughs> like Dylan. And the reason I bring this up to yeah. you is even if he said, let's play, um, you know, let's play uh, round here, you know, and then you're playing it. It's not played like the record, you know? I mean, right? Well, things just morph and change as we, we go along. Right, I get it. But when you're yeah. auditioning, are you just playing it right oh. like the record? Well, um, it's kind of a mix. You know, you're kind of... When, when, when I'm learning something from the record, I try to capture the vibe of what they're doing. Right. And if I feel like there's any like signature licks that become part of the song, I'll learn those too. But mostly... Then I'm trying to bring my own thing a little bit too. It's kind of a combination because well, they're just playing these blankets, and then he's like singing. You know, where is I mean, it? he's like Sinatra, a rock Sinatra in right. a way that he'll change the melody and do things. It Dylan. drives people crazy. But, yeah, 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 you know. yeah. Dylan, I mean, uh, Dylan yeah. has not done a song. I remember I was sitting next to a guy at the <laughs> Dylan show uh, last year, and the guy goes. Is this tangled up in blue? And I go, nah. And I go, wait a minute, it is. It, it would make Shazam on your phone explode. <laughs> you could try to Shazam a Dylan tune live. <laughs> that, that's a tough, you bring up a really big subject. I there. really do. Be, because, 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 listen, yeah. there's, I am a massive Counting Crows fan. Right. I mean, massive. I, I, I changed my whole life around like Wilco and 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 wallflowers and um jayhawks and counting crows once that kind of got into my blood that was it springsteen also uh uh, tom joad record once i get into that my whole life changes completely and and, you know i buy i learned to play guitar I didn't even know. I buy a telly. You know what I mean? I start writing tunes. Okay, this is, I mean, that was the high water mark, like Sullivan Street, you know, fucking uh, yeah. perfect blue buildings. I couldn't yeah. believe I love these. that. I love could, that song. Best song. That best song, song the plays itself. There's best certain song the songs like you don't have to do anything because yeah. it plays itself, and that's the way I feel about that tune. And I have a bootleg from the Slim's record release, which is one of my favorites because they play the record live, like top to bottom, and uh-huh. it's fucking great. And even when they did uh, the, satellite show at the Fillmore I was there and it was fucking smoking you have these two records and it's monumental Uh you know and then somewhere along the way I'm like wow man what the fuck is going on here and the only reason it makes me mad and I love jamming bands like I love Grateful Dead and I love Black Crows they would stretch songs and people would be like these Black Crows songs are 80 minutes long it's so hard to write a fantastic melody and a, and a melody that sticks in your head forever uh, that it, it bums me out because I really want to hear this like fucking, you know. I don't need it yeah. exact to the record. No, but we, we'll do a mix though. Yeah, yeah. We've kind of come back a little. You, you do a mix and it, it's, I think that you can do a little of both. Yeah, I and do you, too. You've got, you've got to remember that these are the people, you know, people want to hear certain songs, they want to hear certain things and you've got to throw people a bone because they're the ones that are allowing you to do this in the first right. place. Right. I mean, how much of that we do on a given night is not really my call. But, we, you know, we, 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 you got to play ball. How you, is the audible on that? Is it just like turns around and says, uh, we're, I'm going crazy on, uh, you know, fucking... Uh, you use your ears and eyes. There's, yeah. certain, there's certain songs that will switch. We'll, we'll, we'll do improvs, you know. Right. But with Adam, it's you got to use your ears and your eyes. But I've played with him so, so much now that I know... Right, you know, kind of what's what's going on, and and I love the that we'll put ourselves on a limb a little bit. I get it. I'm a comic man, and I don't do any shows the same at all. Right, at all. And that, but that's I where do the know best where stuff the, comes. I do you, know where the punchlines are, though. Right, <laughs> you know right. What I mean? And I do know people where, want to hear Mr. Jones. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Exactly. Play Mr. Jones. Yeah, I don't give a fuck about Mr. Jones. I understand that's going to be one where you're like, oh god. But I'm talking about deep tracks on these records. And play him like I mean I would love to see a tour where it was just like here's the first two records top to bottom and just we, well it'd be insane. we may do that at, yeah at, at but a I'm saying point. like the record yeah you know well no I mean? I mean and I talked to Emmer about it I get it I get it you know but there are some things that are like the record too there's yeah. you know there they'll they'll be different ones that 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 go off into other things and so then, back uh, anyway back to the audition because okay. I, I didn't want to interrupt you but no, no, that's i wanted big, i wanted to know how the fuck you auditioned to that you know what i'm saying i did as 
much It'd be as like I could. auditioning for the dead. You know just, what I mean? Just, and they go, we're playing Ripple. And you go, <laughs> the record or the fucking 80-minute version? You know what I mean? Just use my ears and yeah. my instincts and try to try to do whatever. So they 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 uh they they narrow it down to me and another guy who happens to be your but you know Gorman, Steve Gorman. Oh, Steve the, Gorman from oh, the Black, Black Crows. So it's so it's Cheryl Black. Crow and Black Crows coming yeah. back to San Francisco to duke it out on a on a drum off at uh-huh. their Warfield game. Wow. Uh that might have that is probably with the wallflowers or i don't know anyways it's like on the, the, we used to do these shows on christmas and it's december oh, yeah. i remember that and um so we go in we both audition and i only heard it was him later and then they do a vote and they decide on me and then at the at the gig that night i come out on like hanging around just to like play tambourine or gas and he announces to the crowd like here's our new drummer Wow, you didn't even know? And, and well, um, I knew they were picking me, but I hadn't, I hadn't talked to Cheryl, I hadn't done anything. Oh, no, and he yeah. announces this. Oh, no. And then, you know, <laughs> Cheryl doesn't even know I'm auditioning. Yeah, yeah. And then before I could, the first thing that happens in the morning is Gorman, who huh? doesn't get the gig, calls Cheryl's office and to say, hey, you're losing. a drummer? Yes. Whoa! And I'm like, God, you know, so then it makes me just look like oh, a jackass. No. So I call Cheryl and I'm like, look, I had no idea, you know, all I, all I did was yeah. do an audition, you know, we're down, and I said, I wouldn't even consider to do this audition if we weren't on a break, and it wasn't an opportunity to be a band member. Right. And I said, they want me. I said, I don't even know if I want to do the gig. I don't know what I'm getting into here. Yeah. Again, same kind of conversation we had uh, before with the Dixie Chicks, and she's like, okay, and we were laying low, and Counting Crows was about to do two tours, uh, Australia and Europe. She said, go do those two tours. If you don't like it, everything's cool. You still have your gig, which well, is like, wow. You know, yeah. And, and I, I feel like at that point, you know, cause I played with her for eight years. I, I've, you know, I bled for that woman. I did, you know, and, yeah. and, and I earned that. But a lot of times if you're working for an artist and you start talking about somebody else, it, it's, it's done right there. Yeah. 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 Um, but you know, she was really good yeah. to me and, um, so so I got to go do Counting Crows with Cheryl Crow to fall back on. Wow. And then for for a while I kind of played them both. And then um we had uh I was off with Counting Crows after those tours. You know, it worked out great. And then Cheryl was starting to work again. So I'm like, cool, Counting Crows doesn't do anything, I'll go do the Cheryl yeah, yeah. So we're doing stuff and then we're about to go do a European tour. And then Counting Crows gets a one-off for... Uh, oh, no. One-off. Just a one-off. Yeah, yeah. For, Fucks your whole for, money. For uh, <clears throat> AOL. Yeah. Okay? And yeah. But but they, they haven't made me a band member. They're not in a hurry to do that because financially, like, Hell if yeah. I'm a band member, you, you know, they're paying me corporate, really well. You get a cut of that corporate. I get a cut of the corporate. At the tour, I get the cut of the yeah. tour. They're yeah, going to yeah. ease me into that. So the manager calls me and he says, hey, we have this AOL gig. And I'm like, look, I'm going to Europe with Cheryl. And, and then it, it came to a head. I said, look, if I cancel this tour and do this gig, I'm a band member. Yeah. Because once I do this, I'm burning my bridge with Cheryl. Yeah. Because I can say whatever I'm doing Counting Crows, but till the moment I cancel a gig, I'm still Cheryl's drummer. I mean, when, when I cancel that gig, she's going to realize I'm really gone and I'm making another choice. Fuck yeah. And so the manager's like, I'll call you right back. Oh. <laughs> and then he probably got on the phone with Adam, and they called, and they said, okay, you're in. Wow. And then I, then I called Cheryl. And Cheryl knew. I mean, I was actually using yeah, yeah. her as leverage, but. How many years have you been in the Counting Crows now? 14 now. 14 years. 14. Just, it, Holy it, shit. I don't know when it, when. It, 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 when we became the older, you know, I've always been like the young drummer and all of a sudden overnight, like I'm the old drummer that, yeah. you know, but, 14 uh, years. How yeah. many records they got now? Yeah. It's not a lot. <laughs> now the records yeah, took yeah. a long time yeah, to make, yeah, yeah. but, uh, but you know, we did the, let's see, hard candy Shrek, uh, um, then came, um, Saturday nights and Sunday mornings. Oh, yep. Yep. Like we did, we did Shrek and we did a bunch of 
songs for greatest hits record right which is the best way to record because we didn't you know it was just quick I, i'd heard all these nightmares about what it's like in the studio with the band and then right we were only doing a song or a song or two and i'm like wait this is easy but then when we went to do a whole record that's when things slowed down so saturday nights and sunday mornings and then um and then we did underwater sunshine and then like maybe two Live records. There was a live record right when I joined. I remember that one with the uh, Bob, the the power New lines. Amsterdam. It's got the birds. Oh, no, that's the early one. That's oh, okay. the what. That's the one that came out before uh, recovering the satellites. Right. Oh, or okay. right after. Right after. Yeah, because right. it's from that tour. Yeah. Guy. But we didn't. You know, the band doesn't make a lot of records. Right. Uh, so so Saturday nights, Sunday mornings, underwater sunshine, and then. Um, and man, I guess. Is Underwater Sunshine the, the latest, right? The no, la- no, no, no. Now there's, uh, I don't even know the names of our records. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> oh, this is so fast. So rock and roll. <laughs> I love that, right? <laughs> I don't know what it's called. Some, Wait, yeah. Somewhere Under Wonderland. Okay. See, it confuses me because it's so much like yeah. Underwater. I don't know. Yeah, yeah. Uh, and you guys are out give on me the tour song. right now. Yeah, that that record's been out a while. We're due to do another one, and and we're out with um, what Matchbox label are you guys 20. on? Uh, Capital was the last. Like you know, right. we kind of did. We're doing one record deals now. And you're out with Matchbox Twenty, correct? There's a fucking another band from that era, man. I yeah, mean, they about- haven't toured in four years. This wow. tour is doing great. Really, they're, they're super cool. And you know, we toured last summer with Rob Thomas. Yeah. Oh wow. And, and you know, like co-headlining, and we played second. And then th- we had so much fun that we're doing it again. And they're playing second, and it's Matchbox Twenty, but it's still Rob Thomas. You know? Oh, they're playing second. Yeah. Does do do they do the Santana song? It was a hot one, the one he wrote. I don't think so. They're wow. doing all the Matchbox stuff. He did that on his Such on his tour, tour right, and right. he did you know some of yeah. the Matchbox favorite. He plays all hits, uh, and he's a great front man. Yeah, and super cool guy. Really, yeah. like. Let's yeah. talk a little bit about before we get out of here. Uh, you I'll got- talk to you all night, Del yeah, Rey. Yeah. Rum, rum, rum. Rum. That's the sound of Del Rey's guitar when we used to <laughs> we used to play together. You know, did did. Do you, is your record still, can people, because it's, yeah, it's I iTunes played on now. his record, it's, on, and it's awesome. It's on iTunes now. It's out there now. And and I also have to say, you know, I, I always enjoy playing with you, and I think that's a great record. And then years later, and we kind of lost track, and then when I saw you do your comedy bit, it was like, and, and you were great as a music artist, but I felt like, oh man, he found his, he found his real calling. I mean, your calling is to be a performer, but, yeah. but you know, seeing you up there doing the, and it all made sense. Cause, but it was, it was awesome. And it, and you know, I didn't know what to expect. And when you're friends with someone, you're thinking like, Oh, they're going to be good. And then you were awesome. Yeah. yeah I mean, yeah. I was laughing my ass off. It's super hard, man. I, it's so fucking bizarre. You know, there's two hard things in my life. I've really done. One was learn guitar and write that record lone mountain. Yeah. You know, I mean, I, I, I didn't know how to play an instrument. And a year later, I'm in the studio with 10 songs making a record, you know. Um, it's a good and, record. And also, I think that, you know, as uh, and I, I truly believe that comedy was my calling, too. I took the complete long way around. But I also believe that if I could have just played with four great guys forever and had, like, the same guys and got a long chemistry yeah. going and something... Maybe that would have became insane because the reason I think the comedy works so good is my work ethic, and it's just me. I don't have to. The bass player can't make it today because right. me, I'm working seven days a week, seven, you know, twenty four seven. And what was messing up your band members? Money and pussy, right? Yeah, exactly. <laughs> Money, pussy, and fucking time. You know, people's babies and stuff. As you get older, you know. Yeah. Yeah. But comedy is definitely. Uh, I mean, fucking in the last seven and a half years of doing comedy it's been better than anything i've really done in my entire life you know what i'm saying awesome, man. uh and some really really bad stuff too like i bombed a few nights ago and boy do you feel alive when you're bombing you're like holy shit i'm bombing right now this is insane and uh it makes you feel alive you know what mm. i mean as much as bombing sucks and hurts and fucking terrible 
I go, wow, 51 years old, I'm alive. You know, I walk, <laughs> uh, that's a long 20 blocks I walked on Sunday night. I walked back to my place like, what the fuck happened? And I couldn't shake it off for a couple of days. Your confidence goes away. It's like if we you're- We've had gigs like that. Yeah, it's like if you're for a, a day, somebody's going, dude, you're dragging. And you're like, I don't feel it. I don't feel I'm dragging. You know what I mean? Or, or you're pushing uh, drummers. You know what I'm saying? It's the same yeah. thing. You're like, I don't know what the fuck happened. And it gets in your head. And next thing you know, it could take a little bit. You know? Mm. Let's talk a little bit about your uh, one of your stories. And, and, and I always love all musicians have great stories because it's just a, such a loony life. But seeing Dio. Oh, yeah. man. <laughs> Is this Antioch Concert Barn? Antioch Concert Barn. No, 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 no. Where would you see I him? saw that show. I did too. But you know I, that was this, Dio's first show with that yeah, band? Yeah. I talked to Eddie Trunk about it last week. I, I was remember. fucking there. The Antioch Concert Barn is so fucking insane that that even happened. And if people don't understand uh, what we're talking about, when Dio left Sabbath and started the Holy Diver uh, record in that band, the first uh, show he ever played was at this guy's barn in Antioch, yeah. California. This guy thought, I'm going to put concerts on like Woodstock out in this barn. And I swear to God, sometimes I wish I had time travel so I could just go back and just look at that in a sober eye. I remember there's no lights. There was 10 foot mud and there's straw and mud straw yeah, and mud and, 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 and like maybe three porta potties everybody's just pissing outside yeah. and, and there's farm animals actually out there I, I had been Dio out there plays before this fucking place yeah. you gotta think Dio who just comes out of Sabbath who did arenas on Heaven and Hell and Mob Rules yeah. and he goes alright our first gig's at a barn but maybe it was like kind of normal, like, you know, gigs in Europe. Because when you do those gigs in Europe, you're like, where the fuck are we? But <laughs> man, Antioch. I mean, I'm sure Dio, like like all, he, he, he's done all sorts of gigs. And there's and, and the one thing I know about the road after like 30 years or whatever. Nothing surprises you. Yeah. And, and there's always another gig and another experience to have. Yeah. You know, you, there's no way you can ever do it all. There's always some shit that's going to happen right around the corner. Yeah. You know, when when... See now, probably people are like, "Well, what's Dio?" You know, like I, I'm a, you know, I play whatever, but I grew up playing heavy metal. I well, love it. Well, that's that, that's what I, I I try to stress on this podcast a lot. A lot of people just grip on to the five kind of uh, rockers, have like Sebastian, Nikki Six, you know, uh, Eric Turner, Warrant, or yeah. these these like. But there's 365 episodes, and there's whole eras in the show of of alt country. There's whole eras of like R and B and 70s soul and James Brown and 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 Prince and Terrence Trent Darby, Earth, Wind and Fire. You know, there's so much music that right. I I love, and 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 I'm blessed that people do tune in for the five guys or whatever they want. But you're the same as me. You play roots rock and stuff all your life. But we grew up in the Bay Area, and it was the capital of fucking metal, Metallica and all that, you know? And I played in metal bands when I was young. I used to have a big double bass kit, and yeah. I'd go down and, you know, rock Omni. on Broadway, Stone. Rock on Broadway. Yeah. Rock on Broadway. Sidewinder, man. Yeah, yeah. Sidewinder, I dog. I played in a band with Josh Ramos. Remember oh, Josh Ramos from Le Mans. <laughs> from Le Mans. Holy Le Mans, shit. Man. <laughs> they were good, though, man. Yeah, 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 yeah. I mean, I was in high school, and I played... In the in the you know with those guys, I'll and, tell you what, Josh Ramos, uh, Lamonts, they put out a record, and people don't know they did a record on Shrapnel, yeah. which is on the streets, and and that's kind of a medley record. But I think one of the greatest records to come out of the Bay Area that no one ever heard was their record on CBS with uh, you know. Uh, Love lies, uh, addicted to you. Your don't want to wait. Is like a drug. Yeah. <laughs> Your love is like a drug. I'm addicted. What was, Pete, what was the name of the singer? Marino. Pete Marino. Pete Marino lives and in Vegas. Have it, I hear. Man, he had a huge voice. Yo, dude, dude. Uh, you know what he was doing the last like ten years? Like I don't know, twenty years ago or whatever. He was uh, Ozzy tribute in Vegas. He was oh. Ozzy. He sounded wow. exact, dude. And they did all the Randy Rhodes era stuff. Did he get but, fat too? <laughs> uh, probably. But I mean, but, sorry, Ozzy. But that, but that fucking record uh, that came out on CBS, I think it came out the same day as Whitney Houston, and they were they were done. Oh, man. But it has uh, Love Lies, uh, you know, Addicted to You. Yeah. Uh, don't want to work. 
to make just a living. Wanna rock. Just want to rock. Yeah, well, that's that was the scene yeah. that, that I was playing in, in our band. You know, like yeah. we weren't his. And he was the guitar player, huh? He he came. You know, we kind of snagged him when when uh, when Lamont's was. Wow, you know. I never knew that. Yeah. Yeah. He could play the shit out of the guitar. Did he play the Neil Schoen guitar at that yeah. time? Yeah. And he just looked so cool. He kept it really low, you know? Yeah. And it, and it was like, I mean, he was kind of one of my Bay Area heroes, so it was fun. Fuck yeah, dude. It was fun to, 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 to play with him. And if people don't know, the other guitar player was Derek Frieger, who, yeah. who was from Chicago. Uh, enough, Enough's Enough, and uh, he passed away from drugs. Oh. Yeah, he OD'd on heroin years ago, but that guy was uh, basically the George Lynch. He was the next like Eddie Van Halen. He right. could play the. He looked like Ron Wood, but played like Eddie. And the, the yeah, and the drummer Kenny Stravopoulos. Yeah, he's still fellow, playing. Fellow Greek. Yeah, Bogios and Stravopoulos. Somebody the just Greek, sent me a photo. Greek of metal him. drummer. <laughs> Somebody just sent me a photo of him, and he looks exactly the same. He yeah. looks great. He's like a mountain biker. I'd love to see Lamont's get together for a one-off. I I used to go to all those shows, oh. and we were gigging. We were gigging at all those places. You know, yep. I would I would. Uh, uh, anyway, so you oh, go to okay. see Dio. I go to see Dio. I love With Dio. Your brother? This is this is. Uh, I was in junior high, and this is Mob Rules tour. Oh, the best Cow Palace. Uh, okay, this is before the Cow Palace show. We were able to get really good seats for UC Davis. Oh, wow. I we used went, to go there you know, all the time to see shows. You know how you could call in and yep. if you waited, if you called early and just kept on hold? So we had like third row seats and our, you know, we're junior high. Our, yeah. our you know, but I already was playing metal drums and all that. I, uh, the, uh, one of our friends, dads and mom was going to drive us up to Davis for the yeah. gig. So, so that day, uh, my buddies and I, we all have um, wood shop together. Yeah. And we decide we're going to make a cross to bring to the show. Yeah, yeah. And so we, you know, we we do it all. We get this big cross, and then uh, and then I take it home, and I'm like, I'm going to paint it, you know. And so I, I paint it black, of course. And then I, you know, okay, we, you know, the wood's a little rough here. I'm going to sand it down. Then I'm going to put a little grip tape so we can hold the cross on the bottom. Yeah, and then we have splinters. The, yeah, and I get <laughs> splinters, very important. Yeah. And we go to the gig with our prize possession. And, and that uh, venue was epic. They got everybody back then. UC yeah. Davis would be this weird stop where bands could pick up a bunch of like like Warm money yeah. for gas for the buses and everything. But you it's know? still a big arena oh, it's show. A big arena. Yeah, man. I saw Danzig there, Faith No More, Caius, everybody. Right. So we're we're up there, we're we're third row and we're we're taking turns. They let the, you bring the cross in. They, well, we snuck it in. Oh, I mean, what are they not going to frisk little kids? Yeah. You yeah, know, yeah, yeah, so yeah. we snuck it in, and uh, and it's a big cross. We put it down the, the backside, you know, and just sort of yeah. walked in like scarecrow oh. style. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. <laughs> so so the concert's going on, and we're taking turns holding the cross, and then it's 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 my turn, and we're right up there, and I'm all holding it up, and. And Dio's singing, yeah, and yeah, and yeah, he yeah. flips yeah. his hair and he kind of rocks Sign by. Sign of the Southern Cross, <laughs> greatest record Sabbath ever did. I I oh, always yeah. say, oh yeah. yeah. And then he he sees me out of the corner of his eye, uh -huh. and he kind of does a double take, and he goes back and he grabs the cross from me, and then he holds it up in the air and kind of leans back, and the light is just hitting him perfect, and the whole crowd erupts yeah. you know and then all my friends like we're looking at dio we're looking back at each other our mouths are wide open can't believe it oh yeah the oh wood my God. shop cross yo you know I mean, the wood shop cross it, it was my it was my claim to fame it was the biggest thing that ever yeah. happened you know and yeah. and we couldn't believe it and then the next day you know we're all with our mob rule shirts early because it hasn't even come to frisco yet to san francisco yeah, yeah. and um like wildfire the whole school Boge's hand of the cross to Dio. <laughs> <laughs> and, 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 and what people don't know, in junior high, there's only like two, three kids that got to go to metal shows because parents wouldn't let people go. And I would, come, I would show up at school with the shirt on the next day and they'd be like, oh, yeah. fuck, you saw Death yeah. Leopard last night? Hell yeah, I caught the pick. Look, there, he got a pick too. I always got the picks. I would dive to the ground. I was a oh, small yeah. guy. I would grab picks. While people were watching concerts, I would look down I'm like there's a pick or there's a 10 you know you find I, money ground score i would go to every heavy metal show and 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 my my dad would let because it's music yeah. it's like okay it's research so i was really young but i would go to 
every show. Me too. And and what I loved in those days, it was all about the production. You know, they were oh, huge. huge. And I always thought, man, one day I'm going to do a tour like this and with a huge production. And and the funniest thing is that the the closest thing. Well, I mean, it was it was the Dixie Chicks tour, yeah, you know, because the yeah, production was yeah. so big. Oh, yeah, yeah. And it was like one, <laughs> one, one song, the moon comes up behind me, and the other, yeah. there's like yeah. flames, yeah, you know, yeah. and there's... This, this is big... like Dio. <laughs> Where's the dragon? <laughs> yeah. There's a dragon with laser eyes. <laughs> Ozzy had lasers. Dixie Chick, Natalie, you need lasers to say Natalie's <laughs> the star. <laughs> it snowed on stage oh, on yeah, one song on that, that tour. Yeah, and, yeah. you know, but it, it, as far as just a huge production yeah, tour, yeah. that was the closest thing, like, I Ironically, you know, I weighed it all. It yeah, wasn't yeah. quite what I had in mind, but yeah, uh, yeah, yeah. you know, it's I got a, there sort yeah. of. You ever, you ever, uh, you ever hope you could like do a metal tour? Like, say, a band needed a metal drummer for the summer <laughs> or something? Wouldn't that be cool? Could you do Man, it? Have I you played that? Like, I could do it. I'd have to just bust the chops. It's it's all in there, man. Yeah. I mean, the, and the thing that that I bring to the you know every style you learn and and, and everything you do. You you bring in you bring it into other things. Totally. And, and for me, what I take from those metal days and what I still bring to everything I do. Showmanship. The showmanship, exactly. but also the 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 way that you would come out on stage and from the moment you go, it's like hundred and ten percent. I yeah. love that about metal and I hard love it rock too. and just you know, it's 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 balls out from the, you know, re- regardless. I mean, it's, you're, you're playing different we're, stuff, we're but it's just be, an yeah, attitude. Let's fucking it's, hammer this down, right? Yeah. And 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 that spirit is still in me for big time you know before we get out of here for the nerds that listen uh i'd be hung if i didn't ask you what what's your gear now what drums are you playing i years ago you know because whenever i go in the studio i love the vintage gear right ludwig and it, well um i use rogers actually oh, i like all, i have ludwig kit i have rogers kit i have gretch my dad the first kit that I got was when my dad bought me when I was 12 was an old Rogers kit and wow. I still have it. Really? Yeah. What's the bass drum size? 24 or something? 22. 22. 22, 13, 16. Wow. And, um, uh, you know, it's, it's an old kit. I still, I play it at home. I don't bring it on the road, but I have three of them that are all really old. Yeah. And, and so I have a special connection with Rogers cause it was where I started and my yeah, dad bought me that kit. And also if, if you look out there, there are people that are rocking, vintage gear drums but you always see ludwig which is what you which are great drums and you always see gretch how many times you see rogers Never. i'm like one of the few guys that are out there and they don't make them anymore which makes it even better are you playing rogers on the tour oh yeah oh no shit last, yeah yeah wow and they're out of business they've been out of business for a long time where yeah. were they from a u.s company yeah and they 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 went you know it started in um uh uh Cleveland, right? You know, there's there's uh there's different, and then they went. You know, it was like Dayton, Ohio. Then then there was another another place they went in Cleveland, and then uh, and then they moved to Fullerton. Wow, in, in L.A. Huh? L.A. Did Fender own them or something? I don't know exactly. Yeah, I think they got, but but uh, the Fullerton drums are still really good. But each each level has a different kind of sound. Right. But then after Fullerton. They went with the big R logo, and then the drums kind of changed. But I have, but I have drums from each of the different eras. Wow! And, they and they're have, out of business, so you just been do other people time. come to you like, hey, why don't you start playing us or whatever? Yeah. yeah. And I used to, you know, I I endorse Zildjian cymbals, Vic First sticks, you know, things like right. that I've used forever. And I had different drum endorsements, but it got to a point, you know, why don't I just use? Yeah. What I use in the studio live. I don't, you know, I don't need a free kid. And yeah, and, yeah, yeah. and and I think that the the vintage drums just bring out something in my playing that I that And it's I just really cool. Love. Yeah. The more you play these vintage drums, the better they fucking that I mean, years and years, you pass them on to somebody else and they're gonna fucking sound they're, you know, these were played on fucking hundreds of shows, hundreds of yeah. shows, you know? They have more character than the yeah. newer drums, I think, and there's something about when the I love Wood those old ages. sonars, man. Like oh, those from are the great back too. and black era of, of uh, Phil Rudd, man. Yeah. Those old sonars, you know. It's just that fucking thing, you know. I remember our drummer Eddie used to play sonar and he had these fucking cool 80s ones, man. Right. You can't touch that, you know. 
Well, fuck, man. Great talking to you. You, you can, Delray. Rum, rum, rum. Believe, rum. Here, I've been here. I've been in New York for a month, and I just, it's so weird that I've interviewed people that I know from where I live here in New York by chance, you know? And uh, awesome. You got uh, social media or anything? Uh, you know, I'm really lame with that. I've got a Facebook page. Yeah, yeah, Facebook. I, I, right. I do, I do, you know, Jay Bojo said Facebook. I've got a website. Yeah. And the Facebook is hooked up to that. And, uh, and I probably should do at? one more. Is this it? Uh, we're going till October. Oh, wow. Where are you yeah. going? Um, you doing LA? We already did LA. Oh. We played the old LA Forum. Oh, so great, right? right? And all the shows that went on there. But oh, I, you see that when you're backstage, uh, road yeah. down there. And they the, fixed it up. It sounds oh, great. They put a billion dollars into it. Not I'm I'm the not guy, I'm not guy, Del Rey in it. I'm talking a billion no, I, dollars. Yeah, they, they yeah. man, it was amazing. It's incredible. The, the people that do Madison Square Garden, same bought guys. Yeah, yeah. Man, and uh, the backstage is happening. It sounds really good in there. Oh, they did yeah. acoustic things. Well, they fucking, there's a timed video of like a one minute video you can see on latimes.com uh -huh. uh, where they show the two year refurbish of it, man, in fast motion. Dude, they dug it all the way down. So there's a pitch. So the person in front of you is not blocking your view. Oh, wow. They lasered. They had a guy come in for millions and laser all the sound points. So everybody has sound. You know what I mean? Yeah. Uh, and dude, that fucking room. And I thank God they did this because they didn't tear it down. And I'm worried about the Cow Palace where we saw all our great shows because one day that's going to be gone. <laughs> I, and I always say, I, I just want to be big enough comic to where I could do a special at the Cow Palace. You know what I mean? Like, Man. how great would that be? Like, it would be horrible sounding and stuff, but I'd finally play the Cow I, Palace. I. Uh, when I see that, you ever seen the heavy metal parking lot? Of I always course. thought I was going to see myself at the Cow Palace, you know, right. all, all like stoned and drunk before, yeah. <laughs> you know, scorpions <laughs> or made in. Or... movie theater right there where you're pissing in the bushes, you know? <laughs> God, me, Joey, and Fletch just went over there about a year ago, and we broke into the back of it during the day. Oh, we man. found a door unlocked, and we went in there, dude. And the photos were still up of all those shows they had in there, like Evil Knievel, ACDC, oh. Glenn Campbell, uh, Elvis Presley. Those photos are in there. I tried to find who took those photos all over the internet, I can't find it because man, huh. whoever took a guy took every one of those photos, you know. You take, yeah, and in there, and remember the the ramp going in, and as you open, you came through the front door, you went down that ramp, and you're in there. Yeah, Judas Priest, it's Pretty, them. Oh, come there. on, everyone, dude, so, everyone. So when we played the forum, we were supposed to play the Hollywood Bowl. Oh, what happened? Uh, we got aced out by uh, Whitney Houston and um, uh, what's his name. Damn. Who's, who's touring with Whitney Houston? I Lionel Richie and Whitney Houston. Oh, wow. You know, they oh, really well. wanted it. So, But it worked out because the LA, we didn't know how cool the LA Forum was now. So Great to see you, dude. You. Awesome, man. <laughs> Much and, success. Uh, stay in touch, dude. Keep rocking it, Delray. <laughs> Thanks, everybody, for tuning in to Let the Be Talk. Leave a review and subscribe, man. That's how we keep the show in the top 100. Candles lit. Dio. <laughs> 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 <laughs>